go live, go live. Hi. Good morning, everyone. OK, so we're, we're live now. Would you over to you, please? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is um, Abiyano Jibukwe, and I am the chairperson for SPE Lagos Section Special Projects. On behalf of the Planning Committee and the SPE Lagos Section Board, I would like to warmly welcome everyone to the first day of our week-long event, um, the E-Technology Symposium and Exhibition themed Unlocking Oil and Gas Fuel Productivity Through Technology and Innovation. We do have a host of speakers and presenters that will be joining us today, and they will be introduced at the appropriate time. Before we start, I would like all participants to bring out their phones or on your laptops and go to menti.com. I have two questions for you. There's a code written at the top of the screen. Please use this code to provide your answers, okay? My first question says, where are you dialing in from? You know, as the organizers, we have done all this planning and we are curious to know how far we could get. So please go ahead and select the location that best fits. Okay, so there's a code at the top of the screen. Please go to menti.com and type in the code. Um, so far, we've got, um, let's see, we've got uh, a couple of people joined in the meeting, and I'd like you all to select, give me an answer from where you are calling from. So use the best fit. So if you're in the state that is in Lagos section, for example, Lagos or, or your state or any of the other states, please select um, Lagos section. And if you are calling from Port Harcourt section, please select um, Port Harcourt. If you are calling from outside Nigeria, please also fill in. Let's see where we are all dialing from. Okay, the results are coming in and um, let's see how many participants do we have? We have quite a few people joined in. Can you please put in your answers? So far, we've got five people, eight people. More results, please. And a lot of people seem to be joining in from Lagos section. More, please. <laughs> okay, I'll give it um, 10 more seconds and then we wrap up this question and move on to the next question. OK, we, it seems we have a lot more people from the Lagos section out of the 21 people that have joined in so far. 
um, two more seconds and then there it is. So a lot more people have joined in from Lagos section. So thank you everyone for your response. Thank you for joining us. My second says in not more than two words, describe your thoughts on digital delivery of the technical symposium, technology symposium and exhibition. So let's see what you all think about the delivery of this event. This was initially meant to be a face-to-face -face event, but we had to go virtual because of the times we're in. So please let me know. Just type in one or two words. If you are very excited, or if you are hopeful, or if you are dreading what's going to happen today, please type it in. Thank you. Let's see. Do I have the participants here? I can't see any results yet. OK, while I'm waiting for the results, um, Let me quickly run us through the agenda for today. OK, so the agenda for today. So we're going to start off with Ogogo Efium, who is the SPE Lagos section. She'll be giving us her welcome address. This will be followed by our sponsor's remarks to be given by OK, again, the agenda. So uh, we're going to start off with Ogogo Efium, who is the SPE Lagos Section Chair, giving us her welcome address. This will be followed by our sponsor's remarks to be given by Professor Adebo Lube, who is the Managing Director of Green Energy International Limited. Once Prof Adebo Lube concludes his remarks, up next will be the keynote speech by the seasoned speaker, Mr. Chikeze Ngosu. Mr. Chikeze will be shedding light and sharing his point of view on technology and innovation, both from his years of working from his position and from his position as an industry expert, as well as a CEO led by one of the heavyweights in the industry. Each panelist will share their perspectives and give us insights on how their respective organizations arising to the technology challenge, especially given the current state of the industry. They will also be talking about what they have seen work over the years. The moderator will take some questions from the audience. If you are a participant in this event and wish to ask questions, please use the chat box to the right, as our speakers have so much to share with us today. Once we get through the panel session, we will be closing this of the event with a summer of other plans. We will then proceed to a one hour lunch break and reconvene for the afternoon segment where we have nine companies that have been scheduled to showcase some selected value adding technologies. OK, so that will be our agenda for the day. OK, 
Now, I want to say thank you once again for joining us. And I will be handing it over to Ogogo for the welcome address. Ogogo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Uju. If you can just um, show my slide, please. So uh, my name is Mrs. Ogogo Efium, and I'm the section chair for Lagos section, SPD Lagos section. At this point in time, I would like to say um, a big welcome to our illustrious speakers. Uh, this is the largest event of of uh, the Lagos section board year for 2020. And um, I would like to just start by welcoming our our illustrious speakers. Um, we have a, a, a keynote speaker and some and panelists who have already joined us. They've taken time out of their very busy schedules to join us to share their wealth of experience. And I'd like to say welcome to them and thank you. I'd like to appreciate the presence of our sponsors um, from Green Energy. Really appreciate your support uh, of this program. And uh, we have our members from the SPE Nigerian Council Board of Trustees. We have um, senior members of the Nigerian Council. We have members from Lagos, Abuja, Wari, Benin and Port Harcourt section. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to all of them for joining. And of course, we've got a, lo a, a lot of people who have also joined us who are not SPE members. We encourage you to join SPE. Um, and also uh, those who are joining from around the world. Uh, currently, I'm told that we have uh, over a thousand people registered to attend this event. So we have a very wide reach and that's the benefit of having these kinds of um, virtual events. You reach a global audience. We have people who have uh, registered from as far as the US, as Australia and, and Canada. Uh, so we welcome all our members and all our colleagues and, and, and guests for, for joining us. Uh, good morning once again and thank you very much for joining us in this session. I uh, wish all of us great deliberations. Thank you. Over to you, Ju. Okay, thank you Ogogo for the address. Thank you for welcoming us all. So next up is Professor Adebelube, who, who is the Managing Director for Green Energy. Professor Adebelube will be giving us the sponsor's remarks. Prof, you have the floor now. Thank you Uju and Chairperson. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers of this technical workshop and exhibition for the privilege extended to my company and of course to myself uh, to give these very short remarks. I'm quite impressed to see many accomplished oil and gas players and distinguished speakers listed on the agenda today. This workshop is timely because whether you are all, whether you are small, independent or international operators in the oil and gas industry, we are all full of apprehension given the sharp drop in oil prices in the last couple of months. The considerable expertise available in this workshop gives me the confidence that innovative ideas and solutions will be preferred to address three main challenges, namely low oil price regime, Nigeria's uncompetitive production cost, and our industry's penchant for lagging behind other industries in embracing and unleashing modern technological innovation to improve our business. Indications that the precipitous plunge in the price of crude oil in the next couple of months may last longer than historic boss are supported by demand and supply fundamentals. The current prognosis on the future trends in the global energy market is sometimes very somber. The world demand for crude oil and refined products have been severely impacted and it's expected it will take some time for the impact of the COVID-19 virus to be overcome. Supply chains have to be rebuilt and employment have to begin to recover. These are indeed trying and challenging times. Despite the market's challenging period, I do not support the view 
that the industry will be subject to its Kodak moment. Oil and gas isn't going anywhere. And the reality is that the transition to 100% renewable energy domain may not happen soon. Globally, emerging countries will also want to capitalize on their oil reserves, providing literally and figuratively a pipeline of growth for the future. These challenges also further underscore the importance and timeliness of this conference. I would like to encourage all of us to reflect on the case study of the impact of technology on the rapid increase in U.S. shale oil production, a story we are all very familiar with. The U.S. shale oil companies understood that lower prices were here for a longer time. Therefore, they were forced to innovate and become more efficient. This impressive trajectory of the U.S. shale production is attributable to the development and widespread of two technologies, namely horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. This results in an incredible production growth from about 0.4 million barrels a day in 2007 to more than 9 million barrels in the year 2020. These examples confirm that knowledge drives innovation. Innovation drives productivity and productivity drives economic growth. As such, development and application of advanced technology is vital to our industry in helping us with our task of finding and developing oil and gas resources. We need to challenge ourselves in finding better ways to do what we know how to do best. We have to learn more about where the oil and gas are found. We have to learn about how to get the rocks to give up the hydrocarbons they contain. We have to learn how to get the oil and gas out of the ground efficiently and how to deal with all while minimizing environmental impacts. For instance, with the current level of global technology advancement, I believe there must be a solution to seamlessly connect all systems and hardware platforms across various fields of operation, integrating exploration, drilling and production facility, and ultimately delivering useful data to a central location, thereby allowing the operators to make better and quicker decisions. Our industry also needs to forge better collaborations between ourselves and other in learning what others have done successfully or even tried and failed, we are empowered to make the next technological breakthrough that will continue to improve the industry's ability to produce the oil and gas that it was needs. The above notwithstanding, traditional solutions for survival in the current market conditions must not be sacrificed. And they are meticulous planning, operational excellence, operating in a lean and efficient manner to avoid unnecessary cash outlay that they simply cannot afford. Indigenous operators and IOCs must continue to weigh risks and benefits for new projects, decision, and maintain enough flexibility in their project plans to make change. This race that we're in is for the nimble and flexible. In conclusion, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, given the vast expertise and rich experiences of the participants at this workshop, I believe we will have lively sessions and new ideas generated on how development of Nigerian operators can effectively deploy technology and improve processes to create an industry that can win in all price regime. The riskiest thing we can do is to maintain the status quo. I know that my company, and I'm sure most of that operators in Nigeria, we're very eager for the outcome and recommendation from this workshop in order to better position themselves for the challenges ahead. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Professor Devolube. Thank you for that um, very apt um, um, rendition of your remarks. So I absolutely agree with you that knowledge really drives innovation and innovation drives productivity. And of course, productivity drives growth. Thank you so much for those words. Thank you for partnering with SPE Lagos.
and making this event very successful. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much, sir. Now we would now dive into the keynote speech. And as I mentioned earlier, it is now time for us to hear from our season um, keynote speaker, Mr. Zimo, local and international experience in the oil and gas industry. Working various roles such as management of oil and gas projects, new business development, divestment and acquisition. He is a strong energy professional with a proven track record of excellence in managing technical and non-technical business approach and opportunities. Sir, you have the floor now. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good morning. Um, let me first start by asking whether um, my screen that I've just shared is visible to everybody and whether you can hear me very well. Mr. Chikese, sir, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank I you. haven't so seen just... your screen yet. Okay. I am sharing the first slide on the screen. Oh, go, go. You see the screen? Uh, not just yet. I think there's a bit of a lag when um, when it changes over. So let's give it a few seconds. Okay. Yes, we can see us. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, you're very welcome. Um, I'm going to um, take you through a couple of slides as part of the keynote address. And these slides are supposed to set the perspective for the discussions uh, of the panel session. Um, just as a way of a quick introduction, uh, my name is Chike Zemwosu. I have um, almost a 30 year career in the oil and gas industry and a lot of the uh, parts of my career were in research and development, uh, technical uh, work. I was principal technical expert for Shell Global and then I moved into more business roles. So you see a lot of that uh, through the course of my presentation. Um, this is my keynote address outline. Um, if we do not have a history, if we don't go back to the historical perspective of technology and innovation in our industry and look at the impact on productivity of oil and gas fields, then we'll just keep on trudging ahead without actually having understood what worked and what did not work in the past. So that's where I'm going to start. Then I'll talk about, you know, whether technology and innovations have meant, you know, a, a, an improvement in value to the oil and gas industry. So it's not about, you know, I laugh sometimes when I hear people talk about um, it's been a technical success. Now, uh, well, technical success are all well and good. The transition from a technical success to a commercial success is what is important to the business. I'll then take a look at other industry and see how they've applied technology and innovation and how these have been adapted. And I'll really focus on mobile telephony and data for a couple of reasons. In my conclusions, I'll start talking about where we need to go. And we've heard about big data analytics and the Internet of Things. And therefore, we have to find out how the data industry has actually managed in terms of technology and innovation. I will, you know, just briefly talk about emerging innovation and technology uh, based on uh, SPE's uh, Journal of Petroleum Technology and where the industry is heading and how we can improve this business to technology mapping. That's what BTM means. And then I'll, you know, lastly talk about indigenous participation. How well have we done? How have we fared? So my historical perspective, I will go through this very quickly, uh, is from 1850 to 2015, 
and you see what uh, why I refer to that uh, time period. 1848, the world's first oil well was drilled, and it was drilled in Azerbaijan. And if you take a look, um, it's not very clear. I use black and white pictures a lot to show some of these things. And then by 1859, oil was first discovered in the United States. And it's important to put that in perspective, that although the world's first oil well was drilled in Azerbaijan, the United States took the lead in terms of the rapid development of oil and gas. That was because of application of technology. One of the first few things that uh, were happening in the beginning, at, at that time, there was no seismic data acquisition. Um, exploration was just um, a little bit uh, hit and miss. And so there was the rush for the black gold. And one of the first few attempts to actually drill through the Earth's surface in a scientific way was about 1806, with what was known as a cable to where spring pole wells were drilled. And these were drill wells were drilled successfully to about 58 feet. Of course, now when we talk about 12,000, 15,000 feet, it looks as if 58 feet, well, what was that? But that was a great success in terms of application of technology and innovation. By 1825, we had the first four-legged derrick for drilling. 1859, we had a first drilling rig, what we call a drilling rig, which drilled to the amazing depth of 69 feet. By 1894, we're drilling in hundreds of feet. And then by present day, we're drilling in kilometers. And we keep going deeper and deeper. So you can see how technology of rigs has actually um, changed over time. And how that has led to an improvement of the depths we can go to in the search of oil and gas. The next one is about the technology of bits. These bits are, of course, for anybody in the industry, what you need, uh, what you use to make ground, what you uh, use to penetrate rock. Um, I show the kind of bits that were being used at the time of the Texas oil boom in the United States. These were called fishtail bits. Let's call them Texas poor boy fishtail bits. They were described that way because uh, the head of the bits looked like a fishtail. And this was our, as far back as 1901. By 1909, we had the first uh, roller cone bits. By 1932, Hughes, from which, of course, Baker Hughes is derived, um, had the first uh, tricone roller cone bits. And these led to improvements in rates of penetration and the ability to control drilling. And of course, by 1972, we had the polycrystalline diamond compact bits, the PDC bits. And of course, um, Technology has changed um, into how these bits are applied, rotary drilling and all those kind of things. And uh, we keep going further and further. And so we are able to basically um, drill deeper and deeper. In terms of wells, the technology of wells, the first wells, the first oil wells were a little bit more like water wells, a bucket dipped into the hole that was drilled or something, because this was 58 feet. Then we progressed into Conventional vertical wells, we had all sorts of metals put in place uh, for casing and all that. Then we progressed into uh, dual laterals, multilaterals, laterals, and now we drill all sorts of things. You know, all sorts of shapes are possible, all sorts of trajectories are possible, dog legs. Uh, I mean, we, we can do anything we want to do, snake wells and all that. And therefore, technology has helped us in terms of our reach to different reservoirs to be able to produce uh, oil and gas. The technology of logging this is especially close to my heart because I started my career as um, a, a logging engineer with um, the then Atlas Wildlife Services. Although I saw Slumberger here, um, let me just point out that Slumberger was the competition then. But, uh, you know, a lot of things happened in terms of electrical well logging in the 1920s. The Slumberger brothers were all aware of that. The kind of tools that were used, how they were calibrated, up to the present day, in which we have such sophisticated triple combo, all sorts of complicated data analysis in modern wireland logging. So there's been quite a lot of transition in terms of technology and innovation in the technology of logging. In terms of outcrops and seismic technology, um, 
early on, we started with a 2D land seismic. Actually, before that, there was just sounding of waves. A lot of us have been on geological trips, outcrop. Uh, over time, that has happened. But things have progressed. 3D OBC seismic data from about the 1990s. We build all sorts of complicated 3D seismic models. 4D seismic, time uh, seismic has progressed, um, you know, quite a lot. And currently, in terms of outcrop, uh, geological trips to outcrops, um, uh, SPS JPT is showing drone outcrop imaging. In which case, 3D models can actually be produced from outcrops using drones. And it shows you that, you know, instead of walking around or climbing those um, outcrops, which uh, some of us who are afraid of heights could be terrifying, can now use drone technology to do exactly the same thing. Data visualization technology. Okay, this is courtesy of Slumberjay. This is Slumberjay, the, the book. And then um, when I started off as a logging engineer, we used to have these dark rooms where you would go in there and poison yourself with chemicals, hopefully come out still alive and um, roll out some uh, transparency. This was the nightmare of logging engineers, especially people who logged in the north, because, because the transition from the logging cabin into the dark room. You have to come out. And the things progress beyond that, where we had printers and uh, or rooms where they go and visualize things. These things have progressed to the fact that you know you can actually do a walk around, as if you're walking around in the earth and you know pointing out uh, really beautiful. I can also remember anecdotally when I took one of my kids uh, to the shell office, and one of the places they were most interested in where this was in the Netherlands was in this uh, virtual display room. In terms of well completions technology, we've also come a long way. Uh, initially, um, wells were, you know, basically when you drilled, oil gushed out of, uh, you know, the wells that you drilled, and you know you had all these gushes. Uh, sometimes the oil just poked out from the surface somewhere. We then went into conventional vertical completion on Christmas trees, and then we went into smart dual laterals and multilaterals and subsea well control modules. So things have advanced in terms of improvements in technology applications. In terms of artificial lift technology, we went from the early uh, donkey horses to, uh, modern, to modern rod, uh, rod pumps, which are still in existence and are controlled now uh, digitally. We have uh, the VSDs and the um, ESPs, electrical submersible pumps, with their um, you know, uh, displays, visual displays which we use to monitor and uh, the ESP performances and also improve artificial lift. We have gas lift technology, which has progressed. And we have uh, the PCPs, the progressive uh, cavity pumps. So there's quite a lot of technology going on. And if you notice, a lot of this technology has a lot of hardware improvements based on innovation, but a lot of software as well to be able to process a lot of the data that is used to um, control and monitor this hardware. Oil production systems technology. Um, from about 1870, you had these oil stills in Pennsylvania, which served as both the production station and also the refinery. And um, these were just wooden huts, uh, cabins, and um, you know a lot of pipes and all that. Um, a lot of spills happened in that time. Yeah, we then progressed to onshore flow stations. A lot of them dot the uh, you know um, horizon. Then we moved into fixed production platforms offshore. We moved into semi sub host facilities and, of course, uh, FPSOs, the floating production storage and offloading units. An example of that in terms of Nigeria applying that technology is the recent Agena FPSO. But there are many others with the, the Bonga FPSOs. Uh, I think you have the ERA FPSOs and so on. So, quite a lot of um, improvements in terms of innovation and technology in oil production systems. In terms of storage and transport technology, um, initially uh, I talked about uh, the way oil was produced uh, in wells and buckets were used to remove them, then progressed into about the late 1850s to horse-drawn wagons, 
and then progressed into what are known as flatboats and barges for transportation. And around the 1860s, the Pennsylvania railroads were connected into these oil fields, and you had railroads and their rail wagons for transportation. In terms of modern day, we've replaced that horse with trucks. So we have oil and condensate that can be used to transport oil and condensate on land. We have these huge, large oil tankers, which docks the entire um, seaways. Um, currently, uh, a lot of them are waiting to be offloaded, costing about $30,000 a day because of the COVID crisis. But, you know, we did have these improvements in technology. And we also had railroad transportation of uh, oil as well. Now, that in, is the perspective I wanted to bring forward. Now, you can see that a lot of the historical technology and innovation had to do with hardware. I kept saying that there was a lot of hardware, but importantly, there was also data to help us with managing and controlling you know, the performance of these hardware. Now, the second part of this is about the historical impact on productivity. And I want you to pay careful attention to this part, because it's very important for us to understand what the value this technology has created is. Now, I took a look at the historical production. I'll show two slides. Um, on this. One of them talks about from the 1950s to present day, and you can see the increase in oil production and the oil price. Now, we can say that the increase in oil production came basically from the application of innovation and technology. But can we say that we derive as much value from this as well? Has this increase led to better commercial value for oil and gas? you know, uh, investors and producers. I have to answer that question in the course of this panel session. Now, you can also see the fluctuation in the oil prices as well. If you take a careful look in terms of where technology has been, we had offshore drilling, then we had the first subsea wells, then we had seismic uh, data, then we had, uh, we had um, deep water reentry vessels, then we came to the PDC bits, which I talked about earlier, then ESPs, then 3D seismic uh, acquisition. Then we had these uh, guide uh, towers that were used for uh, constructing very quickly and installing um, offshore platforms. We had 3D seismic models which we built. We had uh, LNG big ships for both tankers and LNG uh, liquefied natural gas. And we had, uh, you know, these uh, subsea, you know, gas compression um, modules that were also deployed. So a lot of technology over the times, and that shows in the oil production increases that we've seen over time, and also the productivity of wells. However, extraneous to all this technology are all the events that have affected the crude oil prices from very early years to present date. Now, when I show a comparison with what has happened with data, you would then recognize the fact that the improvements in technology should have led to a reduction in the cost of producing each barrel of oil, and therefore should have impacted the oil price much more than these events. But as you see, these historical events have much more of an impact on the oil price than the technology and innovation. And we have to have a way, while managing this key world, world event, to make sure that the next phase of our technology and innovation will take into account how we can continuously reduce the cost of doing business, the cost of producing one barrel of oil. Now, in terms of the cost of oil production, it is variable across the regions, and that's why certain regions, you keep hearing about Saudi Arabia and their break-even prices, and you know where Nigeria is and what the OPEC average is. So it does vary quite a lot between OPEC, non-OPEC, and terrain, and all that. So there is you know, a, you know, a, a difference in the cost of oil production. Now, in terms of the cost of oil production by country, um, what it con uh, costs to produce a, a barrel of oil, you can see the United Kingdom right at the top there. You can locate Nigeria somewhere, you know, at the top of those. I think it's about the six or seven from the top. And, you know, you come to the bottom and you start seeing the Saudi Arabia's and the Kuwaiti uh, areas. Now, you look at average Brent equivalent break even price by region and terrain. And you can see that. You know, it, the uh, break-even price, you know, is much higher, definitely, for those that have a higher technical cost of production. And therefore, if we do not find a way to apply technology in our local environment to continuously reduce our technical costs, this will be not only a history, 
it may still be our future in terms of how expensive it is to uh, develop um, and produce a barrel of oil. So the poster for the panel session is, what has technology and innovation meant in terms of value to our industry? Has the business to technology mapping been efficient? And this is about the historical. Has it been efficient from this story told? Now to see whether or not it has been efficient, let's take a look at how technology and innovation has impacted other industries. Now let's look at telephony, starting from the 1850s and 60s, from the Graham Bell innovations in terms of uh, both the telegraph and the early uh, telephones to smartphones, what we currently have. That's been quite a transition. If you take a look at it, there's also been a lot of hardware improvements and there's been a lot of data that has supported this uh, hardware improvement. Now let's take a look at what it has meant in terms of, you know, what we can compare to our productivity in oil production. And that's improvements in bit rates kilometer. Yeah, it's a product of the bit rate times the distance. So it's called the bit rate um, distance. Now you can see that I have put the bit rate distance on a log scale because that's the only way you can compare uh, telephony and data, that's telecommunications, with all production. If it's on a log scale, that's on the right, so the, the uh, bit rate is a log scale, while oil production, that's where the comparison is. So they have done significantly better but you know, maybe this is um, what we should prov uh, provide as a comparison, log versus linear in terms of bit rate and oil production. And you can see what has happened in terms of those improvements, the same way I showed for oil, the telegraph, the telephone, coaxial cables, microwave, radars, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G company, uh, fiber optics, and all that. And all these have led to an increase in the productivity of these uh, telephony. Now, take a look at what has happened with respect to the uh, costs. So this is the cost versus our oil energy costs. And you can immediately see that our oil energy cost is uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. Basically, what does it cost for a kilowatt hour of energy based on oil alone? Versus the data cost in dollars, uh, in dollars per thousand bytes. Yeah. Now, um, sorry, in, in dollars per million bytes, megabytes. And you can see that the improvements in technology over time have led to a distinct reduction in the cost of data. But that has not been the case for energy. So even this technology and innovation, the question is really, how has it helped us improve our cost by bringing them lower? So again, these are questions that uh, we have to ask ourselves. Of course, at this time, 2020, we are suffering two things, two impacts on oil. One of them is the COVID-19 crisis, and that is important to note because um, I want to dispel some of the rumors between 5G and the COVID crisis. The COVID crisis is affecting the oil prices critically. 5G network is going to improve data. So um, again, even with this crisis here, data continues to be the king. So the second poser is should our next major technology and innovation not be related to data analytics? It's about big data analytics and the internet of things. They are here now, and since we can prove that data and the innovation in data and the technology of data in telephony, whatever it is, telecommunications, has led to significant reductions in cost, maybe we should start looking at things a little differently. And instead of just thinking about hardware, we start thinking about big data and the internet of things. In terms of emerging technology and innovation, again, uh, this is taken from the courtesy of SP, the JPT. We have robotics for subsea, these uh, autonomous on, on underwater vessels. We have digital course scanning, and these are reliance on all the progressions that we've had in terms of um, you know, technology of data and the Internet of Things, shark cost scanning. We have oil field analytics. We have airborne seismic, uh, which is different from the airborne, um, you know, outcrop imaging. This is actually airborne seismic. We have fiber optics monitoring systems. We have DNA diagnostics, which can diagnose, diagnose uh, the DNA of shales. We have nanoparticles technology, and we have uh, microfluidic uh, chips as well. So all these things are technologies that have been presented by JPT, and I would refer you to these JPT articles from about 2015 to date, which have 
enumerated on these technology advances. However, with all that, I come back to my the same premise. It's about big data, it's about analytics, it's about the internet of things. We have to use this to drive down the technical cost of how we produce the barrel of oil. If we don't do that, the, what was raised by the professor about the fact that oil and gas or fossil fuel energy is here to stay, I doubt it. Because if solar and renewable energy keeps on utilizing this technology to drive down their cost, and we don't, then you find out that they have cheaper and more renewable sources of energy and we're out of business. So again, the Stone Age did not end. One of my favorite things, the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. And the oil aid will not end because we run out of oil and gas. It will end because we lose the focus on applicable technology that will help us reduce costs and make this more useful to the population and more affordable to the world. Finally, on indigenous participation in technology and innovation, SBC Nigerian uh, BOT R&D Task Force continues to work on co en encouraging coordination and cooperation across PE departments within and within with the industry to have a sufficient scale to address you know all these issues about making sure that we participate in R&D within Nigeria it's not just about borrowing technology adapting technology we need to start del delivering our own technology NCDMB R&D has in one of its uh, provisions of the Nordic Act 2010 mandating the NCDMB to regulate R&D activities in the oil and gas industry and we have to leverage on this to make sure that we start clearly making a case for indigenous technology and innovation that will drive down the cost of producing the barrel of oil in Nigeria. The poser is what has been the overall Nigerian experience in either indigenous technology and innovation and or adapting technology and innovation. We have to find out what has been our experience and the distinguished panelists with all the experience will talk about this. Lastly, the Department of Petroleum Resources, this is now about data, big data, has the national data repository and we have to leverage on this. Now, there is a video attached to this. I'm not going to waste time to do that because I don't know how it works, but we do have a top deputy director of the Department of Petroleum Resources on the panel. And we'd want to understand how we're going to make a link between big data analytics and the internet of things with the work they are doing on the national data repository, the NDR. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. And uh, I hand over back to the organizers of the program. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chikese. That was a powerful presentation. Well, it is interesting to know that we started from hit and miss sort of operations, such as, you know, drilling at less than 100 feet to now drilling towards uh, many kilometers of depth. We also started from fishtail bit to now PDC and much improved um, ROPs, etc. Also from 2D seismic to 4D seismic, we've moved on to even the use of drones. Indeed, technology has advanced over time in our industry. Um, you have also compared um, the telephone industry with um, our industry, and it is obvious we need to look more into that industry to understand how we can lower our operating costs. How, what, what else can we do? The answer obviously lies in innovation and more technology. Yeah. So, of course, we haven't done so badly as well as an industry. We have um, technology advances, like you had mentioned in, in your slides, um, the DNA of rocks, etc. But obviously, like you have said, we need more innovation, more applicable technology that will change the way we operate and further reduce costs. So, Mr. Chikese, thank you so much for that um, powerful presentation. Again, as I mentioned, we do have um, other seasoned speakers with us today to dissect the theme further. So Mr. Chikeze will be joining the conversation as one of the panelists. Again, if you have um, questions for Mr. Chikeze on his presentation or for any other panelists for that matter, please type them out in the chat box located on your right. And these questions will be answered together during the conversation. Now, just before we go into the panel session, I would like to call on quickly um, Mrs. Um, Ogogo Efiam, the SPE Lagos Board Chair, 
to come and give us a quick safety moment. Unfortunately, um, we, we skipped this, but we are, we are going right back to it because we are an industry and safety is one of our priority. So, Ms. Ogogo, you have the floor now, please. Okay, thank you, um, Chikeze, for the very powerful um, presentation that you just gave. And I don't want to take too much time and break the break the train of thought. I have a few questions myself, which I'll put in the chat box. But we've been speaking now for almost an hour, and I wanted to remind all of us to please take the time out to um, be conscious of our surroundings. Um, and if anything you hear is, so most of us are working through our headsets. Um, let's just be conscious of what's going on around us. We are, I hope nobody's taking this from a moving, a driving seat or from a, a vehicle that is being, they are driving. Um, of course, that's a big no-no. So I would hand over back to, to Uju. Thanks very much. Let's just keep safety at the top most of our our mind as we go along with all the all the um, events that we have planned for this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oji. Thank you. So now we'll um, right straight back straight into the panel session, and I'm I would like to start to introduce the speakers as they come up. So I, I'm starting with uh, Mr. Enorenson Amadasu. Mr. Amadasu is a petroleum engineer by profession and joined the Department of Petroleum Resources in 1994 as a petroleum engineer. He was deployed to the Upstream Monitoring and Regulations Div Division. He rose through the ranks and he is currently the head Upstream Monitoring and Regulations Division at DPR. Mr. Norenson, we are glad to have you with us. You're welcome. Up next okay, is... Uh up next is Mr. F. Young Okun. Mr. F. Young joined CEPLAT in January 2018 as Operations Director and brings over 26 years experience in the upstream and integrated oil and gas operations across Africa, Europe and the Middle East and Nigeria as well. He is primarily a petroleum reservoir engineer, but combines with experience across all aspects of the EMP sector, including petroleum engineering, exploration, front end development studies, project execution, production, and asset management. Prior to joining CEPLAT, Mr. Okon was mostly general manager of production, of production for Shell Nigeria. Mr. Ofiong, Mr. Ofiong, thanks for, again for joining us. Next, we have Mrs. Olajumoke Ajayi, the Managing Director of Asharami Energy. Mrs. Jumoke is unavoidably absent and will be represented by Mr. Olabode Matthew. Mr. Olabode Matthew is the Exploration Manager for Asharami Energy, a Sahara Group upstream company. He is a geoscientist and a proven oil finder with experience in the oil, oil field development and exploration in several global basins. With over 17 years experience in the oil and gas industry, Bode's interest and core competencies spans areas including seismic interpretation, asset evaluation, divestment and acquisition. You're welcome, sir. The next panelist is Mr. Sopribo Ideria, who is the Managing Director of Shlombije Nigeria Limited. He is un unavoidably absent and will be represented by Mr. Prince Albangu, who is a principal petrophysicist and manager for Schlumberge Software Integrated Solutions in Nigeria. He oversees data services and interpre interpretation engagements in sub-Saharan Africa. Prince has over 15 years experience in the industry, working both locally and internationally. You're welcome, sir. Also on the conversation is Mr. Ifanye Zuka, who is the technical director for Nekonde. Mr. Fani has over 17 years experience in the upstream oil and gas industry with various technical and senior positions. His experience spans through leadership, management, commercial, technical and operations aspects of the upstream and oil and gas industry. He has led and participated extensively in subsurface, field development and production operations activities. Mr. Ifani, you are welcome, sir. Next up is Mrs. Oluseu Sholanke. Mrs. Oluseu is a principal reservoir engineer at Owando Energy Resources, Nigeria's leading independent EMP company. Mrs. Oluseu has 17 years experience in the industry and is dedicated to driving value realization through critical evaluation of subsurface opportunities. She joined Owando in 2013 from NG's EMP div division. Prior to NG, she worked as reservoir engineer in Shell UK. 
Mrs. Olusheo, we are delighted to have you join us. And finally, the moderator of the session, Mr. Femi Odusuti. Mr. Femi has over 15 years of experience in the upstream sector of the oil and gas industry. He worked in various um, roles, including technical research, asset management, reservoir and production engineering, production operations, reservoir simulation and business strategy. He joined Chevron in 2005 and has passion for mentorship and development of young leaders. Mr. Femi, you are welcome to this segment and I'll hand over to you now. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Uju. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so can we have all the panelists uh, maybe show up on video so we can have this uh, conversation? All right, uh, while that is uh, going on, uh, thank you, Drew, and uh, welcome once again to everyone. Um, my job today is, is pretty easy. I'll call it the easiest on the panel because I'll just be asking all the all the tough questions and sitting here comfortably. Uh, but uh, looking forward uh, to an engaging conversation today on the topic, um, given the experience and the diversity we have on this panel, uh, I'm sure it's going to be a, a good conversation. And we have um, a diverse panel, as I've mentioned, from the regulators to the IOCs to independents, um, even across uh, from the service to the production uh, companies. And so, as Ujo has said earlier, the format of this panel session uh, is pretty straightforward. I will start off with a few remarks as I've started right now, um, just to set the stage. I will then give each of our panelists um, uh, an opportunity to make initial remarks as well for about five minutes each um, and then our discussions will begin. Uh, we'll take questions uh, that have been published on uh, the chat uh, feature and I also have some questions myself so please again use the chat feature, make your questions and specific and if you want it directed at uh, any of the panelists please indicate as well. Um, so the theme for this symposium is um, unlocking oil and gas fuel productivity through technology and innovation. Um, in my mind, I want to just maybe make a few remarks around what productivity is. And so um, essentially for me, it's a ratio between the output volume and the volume of inputs simply. Um, it measures how efficiently uh, production inputs such as labor and capital um, can be used in an economy to produce a given level of output. Um, in the oil and gas sector, um, productivity essentially can be defined in dollars per barrel and uh, the previous speakers have spoken a little bit about that um, and it can be further broken down into what we call development cost per barrel, um, the cost uh, appraisal, exploration, field development, the cost to get you to first oil and then the second is in the operating cost per barrel or, or OPEX per barrel um, which is our operations, maintenance, all the people costs um, and overheads and essentially what I'll call the cost to keep the oil flowing. Um, so improved productivity essentially um, gives us improved business results and that is what we strive for at the end of the day. It's not just technology for technology's sake. Um, given that, you know, as I've said, we have a relatively simple equation, dollars on the top, barrels on the bottom, um, there are three ways essentially that we can improve our productivity. One is to get more barrels of oil or gas for the same cost. The second is to get um, the same barrels of oil and gas for lower cost. And the third, which is the preferred, is to do a bit of both, get more oil at a lower cost. Although the first two options are acceptable, the, the third is, is always more um, preferable. Um, given the current situation has been talked about earlier, um, we have the lowest oil prices that has been seen in decades um, as a result of this demand destruction. And it's become even more imperative as we expect lower prices into the future to be able to succeed in this environment. These are the new normal conditions. Um, at Chevron, we call it winning in any environment. So whether low prices, high prices, um, tough conditions or any other conditions, we expect to be able to win. And I think this is where technology um, plays a big part. Um, one major statistic that I've seen recently is that 45% of the activities that we do today um, can be automated by the technology that already exists today. And you know, a couple of these have been mentioned before. In terms of how do we improve more barrels, um, data analytics, this is what spurred the shale industry in the US, as we said earlier. Open data sources, big data, machine learning, cloud computing, improved drilling techniques, fracking, um, longer laterals and things like that would help us get more barrels. 
Um, in terms of lower costs, um, I, I just named a few um, robotics and drones. Right now, there's technology to use robots to do inspections. Drones are doing inspections. There's hologram technology, digital twins, where you don't need experts to fly out to a remote location to solve a problem. So you can save costs in many ways. Remote uh, well monitoring, remote reservoir monitoring is already existing, and we just have to find out how to apply that to improve our productivity. And lastly, this, this meeting is a good example of how technology can be used in a virtual manner to help improve the productivity. And so I will leave it there and I would um, open up uh, the floor to our panelists. Um, again, the panelists would uh, provide opening remarks for about five minutes, focusing on the theme. And if you can give examples of how your organizations are applying technology successfully or what you are learning or what is ongoing, um, would um, appreciate that. And I know the attendees would appreciate that as well. So I'd like to start from uh, Mr. Madasu. Can you give us your opening remarks, please? Okay, uh, th thank you so much. First, I want to thank the organizer for putting this together. And uh, let me also thank my very good friend Chike uh, for that uh, powerful uh, keynote presentation. And also to thank the moderator for, for the opening. Basically, um, Oloki, oil and gas with uh, productivity through technology and innovation. I'm pro just going to give the regulator pers regulatory perspective after which uh, we'll come back and do more details during the uh, Q&A section. Uh, in the broad sense, the department has the regu a statutory regu re responsibility of ensuring compliance to petroleum laws, regulations, and guidelines across the oil and gas value chain. The GPRO in the 21st century is an opportunity creating agency. And why did I say this? When we when we issue when we issue license, we guarantee investments. And when we and when we issue approval, we guarantee participation and so stimulate job creation. So va so value is created. So we no longer focus on routine job in DPR. We now watch over uncertainty in the in our industry and also try to prove or create solution way ahead. We also research into a new new trending new trend in the industry, new ideas, new things. So the department philosophy behind innovative and technologies technological strategy has been one to align our activities in line with international best practices, also achieve government aspiration as it concerns the ease of doing business in Nigeria, and also to achieve government aspiration as enshrined in the national oil and gas policy and the ministerial mandates. Over the years, Hello? Yes, we are with you. Uh, go ahead, sir. Okay. Over the years, the departments have been involved in a lot of technology um, across the upstream value chain, um, starting from exploration all the way to drilling, all the way to development and then to abandonment. And we have been able to come out with some of this innovation and technological tool that basically help us in carrying out our day-to-day -day regulatory activity. There is no way you unlock oil and gas productivity in the industry without also um, if, uh, uh, making sure that the regulatory role is also done efficiently and effectively. So we have a lot of uh, innovation and technology we, have, we are deploying our system that have also helped to further enhance our own job as, 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 as regulator. We have the National Production Monetary System, the LPMS, which basically help us to, to, to carry out and get so much value from production accounting. We also have um, other uh, technology that have been brought on board, the value 
uh, uh, the value monetary benchmarking, which basically we are doing now in this in the system to basically carry out cost benchmarking across the upstream value chain, to carry out benchmarking in all the activities. So because when you talk of cost reduction, there is no way you talk of cost reduction where you don't benchmark. So we are presently doing that and we have developed a technology that will help us to maximize that. We also have um, our annual work program where we are going to engage the operators on, on automation process such that we mine a lot of value, carry out a performance analysis and then rank them. We believe that that will help us to drive um, healthy competition that will stimulate um, um, healthy, that will stimulate productivity in the industry. And this ultimately will break down, we unlock oil and gas feed productivity. We have so many other ones across the chain. We have what we call the COTO, the COLT, which basically will help us to monitor all the gas, all the, all the L L L LNG vessels, the, um, the, the tankers that come in and out of the country, even up to final destination. We also have some other one that is presently being de uh, developed in the system um, to ensure that you submit all your, all, your, all your approvers online and then we work it with you in order to turn out, uh, to shorten the processing time and therefore in improve on productivity. When the, when the efficiency of the regulator is enhanced, it has a way of unlocking oil and gas product, feed productivity because there will be speedy delivery of, of approvals. The time will be shortened. And also in the department, we have, in order to be able to adopt all of all this technology that is coming, we have a unit that is adopting technology. And so any technology you want to bring on board, we don't just take them. We want to be able to process them. We want to be able to unveil the risk. We want to be able to unveil the uncertainty and also mitigate and reduce them. All of all that, we believe, we help in, in quickly adopting the technology and then uh, 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 bringing, uh, unlocking oil and gas feed productivity. Um, we have talked about um, slow pace in, in technology adaptation. And because of our engagement with the industry, we believe that that one can be can be done quickly. Uh, even though we still see a lot of non-compliance to technology ad adaptation from uh, from uh, the indigenous and the marginal field operators, um, the the IOCs, we, we have seen a lot of compliance. To I think at this moment, I want to stop here, and then maybe uh, later. Uh, during the Q&A Q &A section, we can then drive deeper into some of these uh, opening remarks that I've just done. Thank you. Okay, definitely. definitely. Thank you very much for your remarks. Hello. Uh, so next up, I would invite... Uh, uh, next up, I want to invite uh, uh, Bode Matthew. Uh, Bode, can you give your opening remarks, please? Uh, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Femi. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Okay, yeah. Um, with the recent downturn in the global oil and gas prices and the corresponding negative effects on investor funds and operators' returns, um, we've discovered that majority of EMP operating companies uh, will be cutting down on investments significantly. A lot of um, FIDs will be delayed and that we will have um, stoppages even in embarking on new capital projects. And um, these are indeed challenging times for the industry. And um, this development has greatly reduced the number of potential exploration, appraisal and development wells that can be drilled at this time. Um, and this will slow the growth of the reserve addition um, that the government of Nigeria is actually interested in. There is a drive to drive the reserves that we currently have, um, so that as we continue to produce what we have, we're able to replace this. Unfortunately, a lot of this will be delayed um, within this season. 
And to make matters worse, uh, producing companies will continue to pump oil from operated mature fields, thereby depleting the existing reserves with non-corresponding effort for reserve replacement via new exploration discoveries. To mitigate the long-term effect of um, these non-existent investments in making new finds and in appraising the currently existing opportunities, uh, operators in the industry would have to adopt new strategies that integrate new technological developments. Um, we've come to discover that these technologies cut across from seismic up to simulation, um, and they include redesigned seismic data acquisition parameters, when new algorithms are also put into our seismic processing to be able to get better value from currently existing data. In this time and season, it might be difficult to go on new data acquisition. So the shortcut will be to get more value out of the currently existing data that companies are sitting on via new seismic interpretation, um, where you currently have time migrated seismic data. You probably want to take advantage of um, a PSDM processing that allows you to gain better value from currently existing fields so that our development and our focus will be on these existing um, operating fields. We have noticed that a lot of um, rapid technological advancement has happened in the industry in recent years. These technologies are providing different but undefined opportunities for producing conventional and unconventional oil and gas in different regions of the world. Example comes from the United States, where the unconventionals have been able to do a lot of uh, wonders in recent times. Uh, we've had reservoirs that we never have produced in some parts of the world, like in the Niger Delta, where we have a cut off of something, anything less than 16%, 17, 18%, we don't look at them. But then we have a situation where new technologies have come on board and such um, reservoirs are beginning to, to be attractive. As we speak today, with the most recent crisis with the COVID-19, um, we now have operators who are now redefining their cutoff, where porosities were limited to 10 before. Now they are looking at porosities at 5% to see what they can continue to bring in from, from this new, uh, from these old discoveries to be able to maximize production um, and be able to get more money in the bank. We say technological change is the main driver for the global industry uh, for the oil and gas sector and this cut across governments, policymakers and all stakeholders. Um, we need to continue to deploy these new technologies and we need to increase our technology adoption rates. Um, in Sahara today we have been able to take um, advantage of a lot of these new technologies around. Uh, for a case of business continuity, to be sure that we are able to continue to operate, different technologies have been implemented, which allows teams from different locations. Um, we're currently operating about some 37 countries and business has to continue. So we've been able to bring on board some um, applications that we have been able to deploy for the teams to continue to communicate and to continue to interact as team members and to be able to make the work to continue to flow. We're also investing a lot in, in innovation. We have a department that we call the business innovation department that is able to put a lot of the complex processes and simplify them such that we're able to reduce man hours that are spent on such um, activities and be able to increase the value that we get from, from our business. Um, I'll rest my case for now. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll look to hear more about uh, this business innovation. I'm sure that people are eager to apply those kind of um, technologies in their own organization. So we'll move on to, uh, to Effie. Can you give us your opening remarks, please? All right, thank you, uh, Premi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. All right, so good afternoon all. Oh, sorry, good morning all. Um, first and foremost, 
I want to say a big thank you to uh, the organizers of this uh, conference and the webinar. I'm sure a lot of work must have gone in behind the scene uh, to make this successful. So thank you very much. Also, thanks to the keynote speaker and also my fellow uh, panelists. So a quick, quick, just quick looking back to build on the keynote, uh, the key points from uh, Chike's uh, presentation. So, so engineers and geoscientists have been working collaboratively with service company, research institutes, <laughs> academia, government agencies, regulatory bodies over the years. I'll say in the first 20, 30 years ago when I started my career, uh, innovation and tech was very much uh, to drive, help reduce economic development of oil fields, bringing down, you know, UTC, UDC, uh, unit uh, development costs. And a lot of focus then was very much around subsurface uh, based on the achievements made around, you know, data acquisition using neural networks, for example, for geophysics, uh, seismic interpretation, reservoir characterization, and overall subsurface imaging to help underpin uh, field development and, and wells as well, like we saw in uh, GK's uh, presentation. Uh, and that was what led to the whole drive for horizontal wells, multilateral, you know, smart wells with, scr with scrums for commingled production. I'll say in the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, I've seen huge innovation and tech now in the surface world uh, with very complex uh, DCS systems. If you look at the Gulf of Mexico, where a lot of operators are now moving uh, control room into the onshore uh, from offshore, where we can actually operate facilities way, way far away from those shallow water, deep water assets, you're doing that onshore. And a lot around you know, things around condition monitoring, exception based surveillance, and on the surface facilities where we've done a lot around vibration, temperature, pressure, uh, uh, data, as data becomes uh, key and then also the computing power becomes quite uh, uh, advanced, we then see a lot of work around predictive maintenance uh, using big data, especially in equipment, uh, rotating equipment where we've had a lot of reliability challenges with turbines, compressors, and pumps. So data scientists are now becoming a big aspect of the industry uh, following the advent of more computing power, big data, and IoT, and data analytics. So looking forward, I think oil and gas companies have no choice. Uh, we've been slow. If you look at the poster, which uh, uh, the keynote speaker uh, uh, indicated on the slide, I think overall we've been very slow. Um, but now I see we're very much becoming a tech company as against an oil and gas company. Uh, following the trend we've seen in e-commerce or B2B or B2C world, when you look at companies like uh, Google, Amazon, Tesla, Uber, Airbnb, these are basically technology companies, not necessarily commerce or accommodation companies. The technology that has been driving the sort of disruption we've seen in, in that sector, which is quite a source of inspiration for us in, in oil and gas. At the C-suite level, I think we spend lots of time around strategy development for t uh, innovation and technology. Also, looking for ways we can also develop talent because it also requires a, a whole different set of talent to really work this space. Um, and I think the key driver hasn't really changed for innovation and tech. Uh, it's around how do you make uh, developments or investment become uh, more attractive and leave people out of poverty. And also now recently, we're also tackling the issue of climate change and sustainability. So uh, if I look at CEPLAT, our, our approach is about value. It's not just technology and innovation just for the fun of it. We do know that um, uh, digitization does present a huge uh, opportunity for us in the oil and gas uh, industry. Uh, according to the uh, Economic, World Economic Forum, I think it's capable of unlocking about one trillion, one trillion value of oil and gas industries and another $640 billion for both customers and society. So the, the price is quite huge. But if I again zoom in onto CEPLAT, for us it's about you know, making the right choices, the right investment decisions, whether it's M&A, uh, development opportunities as we go, because we're in a more challenging and more difficult portfolio environment based on acquisitions made 10 years ago. So these are very aging, aging assets, very old fields, each the right asset integrity, uh, marginal oil and gas recoveries, uh, uh, reservoirs, uh, process safety issues, produce water, flaring, equipment reliability. Also, we're going to be facing the issue around the commissioning and restoration at some point as these assets uh, begin to outlive uh, their economic life. So I think how we're adapting to this space in satellite is 
We're building, uh, we're working with Huawei Data Storage Huawei uh, to build a data warehouse. Um, we're also looking at a lot of remote uh, surveillance uh, to help reduce the ferment and also reduce costs. We're also building a virtual asset uh, monitoring uh, model, which will help us drive uh, short-term, medium-term WRFM well reservoir facilities management opportunities. Uh, we're also doing the same around the, the, the B, uh, Power BI to monitor business performance in real time. And it all comes down to collaboration across several functions. Gas is also one area we, you all know we're very bullish about. So supply drives over 30, 40% of the gas that powers the homes in Nigeria today. And because of that, we've also adopted a lot of new technology in the gas business. We've applied uh, computational flow dynamics and finite element analysis to investigate quite a number of uh, root cause failures and process strains. We're retrofitting LPG solution to, to existing gas, gas uh, asset where we can extract more value from, from those gas streams like the C3, C4, as against uh, flowing those gas, those uh, C3, C4. We also do a lot of real-time optimization, process optimization, uh, multi phase flow technology, numerical well test, and also extending downtime of our AG compressors uh, using gas recycling technology. What we've also seen is if you look at a lot of gas process training in the past, they were based on Joe Thompson, but now we're moving into more depleted gas reservoirs where we're now using mechanical refrigeration unit to help drive uh, development of those uh, of those two. and the new gas plant we're building in Sapele will be based on MRU and the also combo MRU and JT technology. So if we look at the future, I think we see lots of automated subsurface modeling, autonomous drilling, and quite a lot of automation coming in uh, to a business, whether you're in the exploration, appraisal, uh, development, or operations phase, it applies to all. But we also see some norms, a lot of challenges around how do you adopt tech and innovation. First and foremost, your workforce got to be adaptable. There's also lack of awareness and business support, cost of technology infrastructure, which is a big challenge for us in Nigeria, especially not having all the infrastructure in place. I talked about remote control room in the Gulf of Mexico being moved onshore uh, uh, New Orleans. That's because there's a, there's a massive fiber optic cable that goes around the Gulf of Mexico. So it's very easy to then adopt and, and deploy new technology. We also have the issue around technology security, uh, which we all know very well. We've seen a number of hack cases uh, in Saudi Arabia and Furia countries that has been quite very expensive. And the other two issues which we also face about data silos. So the way we're structured in EMPs, every discipline has got its own data model, data structure, whether you're a geophysicist or reservoir engineer or petrophysics. And that's, that's one big challenge we'll have to uh, overcome. We've got to go into a world where you can integrate uh, data irrespective of discipline seamlessly across the entire value chain. And then the issue around data quality and interpret interpret interpretability. So overall, I'll say coming back to the posers, I think we've been slow. I think with the collapse in, in, in oil price, like uh, was earlier alluded to, uh, following the demand destruct uh, by COVID-19, every company is now looking inward and looking at how in the next wave of, of opportunity, once we start going to the recovery phase, how do we now drive innovation and technology to help position this industry uh, on the longer term. I think those are my own early uh, opening remarks, uh, Femi. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And we're already going into some detail there, so I'm sure we'll dive a little deeper as we get the questions that are coming in. And so just to, to pause there and say, keep the questions coming. We see the questions and uh, once the opening remarks are, are complete, we'll uh, dive straight in. Hopefully we have enough time to touch on uh, all these questions. So I want to ask um, Sheon to give her opening remarks. Sheon, are you there? I have. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good, it's not afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm very happy to be privileged to uh, contribute to the discussion going on. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to the organizers for putting this together. Uh, so, in Orlando, we embrace technology. We actually believe that uh, it's critical for uh, an, an indigenous oil company or any company actually in the te technical space to embrace uh, innovation and technology. And this is why uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chike, when he gave his uh, keynote address, he, he, put, he put out there the case for action which was cost, uh, the energy transition, 
and uh, environmental impact. And we cannot ignore uh, we cannot ignore these factors and what they mean for us, especially in Nigeria. But they mentioned earlier that uh, the Niger Delta is a mature province. We have brown fields and uh, small undeveloped opportunities. And unfortunately, uh, for small and mid-sized uh, oil and gas producers, this is what we are left to play with uh, because the international majors have uh, been in Nigeria for uh, 40, over 40 years and have uh, you know, developed the big fields uh, onshore. In doing this, in order to get value, we must embrace technology and innovation because in order to get uh, the last value, improve your recovery factor, you will need technology to do that. We know uh, from studies that have been done that if we are able to use HPHT, high pressure, high temperature drilling, um, deeper drilling technology, we know that we are likely able to access more volumes and improve our, our reserves, like Body was mentioning earlier. Uh, this is for the same acreages that some of the indigenous companies hold today. Uh, we also know that if we deploy uh, performance improvement technologies like uh, that uh, help us with problems which typically plague uh, mature oil fields, uh, produce production of water, production of um, um, of water, lower, lower, um, lower pressure. We know that if we adopt technology which already exists today, we can't even brand them as innovative. We know that we can extract more value from our assets. Now, Mr. Chikis mentioned about business and technology mapping, and I want to, I want to really dwell on that because this is where the perhaps the slow adoption to technology has 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 had a problem because small com smaller companies are driven by value. And in my bio, I think um, an allusion was made to my bias for value. I'm not a pure technocrat. Um, and for a lot of people and a lot of small operators who need to survive, technology and innovation can sometimes seem nebulous. And what needs to happen is a proper mapping of business to technology. What are the commercial value for some of these things that we want to do? I can't just be for, for the sake of technology. Uh, for us in Owando, uh, we, the way we approach it is what are our biggest problems? What are the things causing us headaches? And for us, it will have to be insecurity. What we have done is we have partnered, uh, we have a partner uh, company and we have been working on um, manned aerial surveillance drones. And what we want to use that to do is be able to monitor our, our, our assets remotely. It will help us to uh, manage environmental spills. This technology is able to identify uh, difference in materials. It's able to see from quite a distance, identify targets, um, track targets. This will facilitate, uh, you know, I deter, de 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 deterring people, I beg your pardon, deterring people from um, nefarious activities. We'll also make sure that we can find the targets and hold them to, um, and hold them to, to, to their actions if and when needed. I mean, we all remember what happened in 2016 when the Transfocados pipeline was down for uh, about 18 months in, in 2016. That had quite a ruinous impact on a lot of um, smaller oil companies. Uh, this cannot continue to go on. And, uh, you know, it, it might be interesting to do, you know, neural network mapping and etc. But those kind of um, technologies pale in significance when you have a, a serious pinch point that is stopping you from moving your commodity from wellhead to point of sale. Um, another technology that we have also been looking at, and I believe Effie touched on that, is um, um, business improvement technology. Uh, he mentioned Power BI. In Owando, we're trying to customize a product uh, that will help us uh, for our own particular needs. We are hoping that uh, with with the clever and fast computerized analysis, we're able to uh, analyze our data quicker and make better business decisions. This is something we're looking at. Um, and I suppose that is linked to artificial intelligence, which is also something that Orlando is looking at keenly. Uh, I want to maybe address some of um, the points made in the keynote speech. I remember um, Mr. Chike saying that uh, he has heard too many times about when engineers 
do something and they call it a technical success and do not call it a commercial success. I myself have heard it too many times. Perhaps I might even have been guilty of um, saying it once in a while. And uh, it's, it's something that we need to change. It's something that shows that we need to change the mindset of the industry. There should be no such thing as a technical success. So this might be one of the hindrances we're facing. He also asked if we were slow to technology. I think the industry has been slow. I think we are being too harsh on ourselves because I don't know if people remember the pickle theory by Herbert when it was postulated. And in the 1980s, this was real. I mean, we may have forgotten that, but in the 1980s, this was a real fair that in the 2000s, we reach pickle and we run out of oil. But we are producing today at all, globally almost uh, 100 million barrels of oil a day. Um, Herbert thought that we would pick out at uh, uh, 12 million barrels, about 34 million barrels uh, of oil a day. And why hasn't that happened? It hasn't happened because of technology, because of 3D seismic, better imaging, um, being able to drill deeper, being able to improve our recovery factors. So I know we tend to be harsh about uh, hard on ourselves in this industry, thinking that we have been slow to embrace technology. But if you really think about it, we have done very well. Um, we can do better, of course. But in the, and if you now zone in to local issues. Locally, maybe that's where I might be harsher. I think that we have been slower to adopt technology and that is because of the nature of our reservoirs. Nigerian reservoirs are very benign. They don't present a lot of difficulty. Beautiful reservoir properties, sweet light oil. It just comes out without too much, um, um, too much cabling, so to say. That's why you see in Nigeria, we don't do a lot of horizontal wells. We don't do a lot of lateral wells. We don't do a lot of sophisticated things which are now considered uh, de rigueur in other provinces within the same industry. Um, so another uh, thing that I would be interested in. Sorry? Sure. I don't want you to yes? give out everything during your opening remarks, so oh. I would, uh, okay. <laughs> so if you don't All mind, right. I'll interrupt you there. Okay, and so I'll close out. out. Uh, I wasn't aware my five minutes was um, running out. OK, so to close out, uh, Owando and, and I believe I speak for the indigenous companies do uh, embrace uh, innovation and technology and we look forward to what we can learn and contribute to it in this session. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so next up uh, um, uh, is uh, if I as we can to give his opening remarks. If I can you hear me? Are you there? Yes, can you I can me? hear you, Femi. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, please. All right. Thank you, uh, Femi. Uh, thank you to the organizers of this event. Um, I'm sure it's been a lot of work uh, putting this together uh, from all the planning stage and following through with all of the uh, panelists. Uh, thank you as well to the uh, to the sponsors as well as the keynote speaker. It was it was quite an apt. Uh, presentation to steer us in the right direction on this sort of technology. I will start by uh, anchoring on what he said. We've seen a lot of progress on the hardware side of things and putting it in context, the hardware progress is very good. Uh, it has given us the opportunity to create possibilities we can go for the harder finds, we can go for the harder drills, uh, we see a lot of possibilities. But coming to optimizing on some of the challenges that we have down uh, here in Nigeria, uh, you see that we need, we need, then need a lot of optimization as some of the challenges that this recent hardware pro do provide. Uh, may not be some of the challenges that we face down here. The, the software, this, the data side of things are going to be able to give us opportunity to optimize. You see from Chike's presentation that as our technology is increasing, essentially uh, is improving as we go along, our cost didn't mirror that. And that's a, that's, that can be explained because some of the things that the new technologies are doing is to help us get the more difficult finds, get the more difficult uh, terrain, 
but the classic terrains as well, the data technology that will help us shrink the cost of some of those class classical terrains, uh, we may not have sufficiently leveraged on that. And some of the things that I think we we uh, doing and we all need to look at is a cultural change in the industry, particularly driving organizational decency to appreciate the the need for multi-skilled uh, workers, workers with the ability for learning transfer, because you have to use some of these learning transfers to move from data, and you need your workers to and professionals to clearly identify where the meeting point of this technology and business value is. You need to use, we need to use this data to reduce the finding costs as well as development costs. And as most of us are right now in the operating phase, uh, this data is very integral. Uh, F. Young mentioned very clearly, uh, they, as, as we move from the oil to the gas, the need for reliability or some of these rotating equipment. As we are in the Delta, they need to use this data and technology for remote monitoring. Uh, they need to also use this data for availability of some of the delivery delivery lines. So you see clearly that we, uh, the question is, as we engage in this data, is that reducing the even number of people that we have working on some of these assets. What value is this big data data analytics delivering to us? Is it dropping down our uh, cost of operating this asset? Is it dropping down our development cost? Some of the specific things we focusing on is trying to steer our teams towards learning transfer being deliberate about those and not just leaving it to circumstances. Uh, early commercial awareness of the team members is very important. Uh, Chike has mentioned, as well as Sheung has mentioned, the, the definition of technical success and without business success. It is important that uh, all of our team members recognize, uh, are commercially aware and understand that it's not, an, it's not a, a laboratory experiment that we're doing, it's a business. And, and it's also, this is also where the, the C-suite is required to take active uh, interest in, is in partnering with some of these technology providers. Yeah, partnering with some of these technology providers. The relationship that is going to deliver value will require a not a transactional, not a completely transactional mindset, but it's quite a partnership mindset where you will partner with the technology providers who will be able to see your constraint because the way you apply one technology in one domain and in one situation is completely going to be different from another circumstance that another person is facing. So, so it is such that the that we clearly understand that we need to partner with these technology providers. Uh, if you are deploying remote monitoring, for instance, you need to think of uh, how you will be able to use this technology. And, and also, you need to think of the security for the, for the places that you're putting this remote, remote monitoring. And that requires significant back and forth and iteration with the technology providers. Uh, so the independence needs to be a bit more deliberate uh, about it uh, because the as you are looking at survival, uh, you we do not need to consider technology as luxury as we are now. It, it is essential for that survival that we're looking for and right. to move into tribal. Yeah, so we shouldn't take it as a luxury. There's a mindset that quite a number of us do take it as a luxury. Uh, but where we are now, it is, it is one leverage that we need to anchor on to, to survive the challenges that we currently face. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I'll just, just wrap up. I, was, I thought you were done. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, so essentially, uh, we, have, we, haven't been, we haven't been very fast and speedy in adopting uh, some of these technologies. 
most of the technologies are out there. It is to leverage learning transfer to be able to bring it to our day-to-day -day value maximization. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ifani. And so, so last uh, panelist to, to give his opening remarks is uh, Prince. Uh, so Prince, are you there? Can you give your opening remarks, please? Hey, Femi, just confirm you can hear me well. Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. All right. Okay, so good morning, uh, everyone. And uh, I want to really appreciate uh, SPE Lagos chapter. You know, I, I think this is uh, part of adapting to the new normal. You know, the, the, the first time this workshop was advertised, it was supposed to be a physical uh, workshop. Uh, but here we are today, uh, you know, on the back of the resilience, agility, and uh, of course, uh, the ability to adapt, which we've seen from from SPE uh, in this Lagos chapter, we, we we see them transiting from a physical to a digital workshop, and and the benefits are definitely obvious. So I want to, uh, you know, touch on a few points, uh, as I know time is fast spent already on the opening remarks, but then. Taking from history, which we did here from the opening, uh, from the uh, first from the uh, sponsor's remarks and from the keynote speaker. Um, sometime in 2015, there was a mantra called uh, lower, lower for longer, you know, lower for longer regime in the industry. Now, that has sort of driven quite a bit of uh, technology and innovation uh, because from that time, due to, uh, you know, uh, low cost of uh, the low price of uh, of of of, of uh, the commodity, which is oil. Uh, we we did see the you know commensurate uh, and then the strong pressure on operating costs, reducing operating costs. So operators started looking and entire industry looking at ways to really optimize cost, and that really accelerated uh, you know uh, adoption of certain technologies. And today. Uh, we are back again to even a worse uh, regime than we were uh, in 2015-2016. In so one thing that we can learn uh, from all this is that there is need for us to uh, quickly accelerate, uh, you know, to digital technologies, which are enablers to help us in the industry. And a uh, couple of uh, uh, panelists already touched on the fact that as an industry, oil and gas industry, we are very late uh, in adopting technology in our uh, operations. Not, uh, 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 you know, late in the sense that we've not been using technology, but catching up with, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, other industries, uh, you know, other sectors are doing. So one thing I want to pick from uh, the keynote speaker is the business and technology map. And I want to bring it home a little bit uh, because here we are in Nigeria, we, we have a peculiar situation. Uh, and uh, Chike mentioned clearly that, you know, not just looking to uh, take technology that is out there, uh, but then trying to look at also homegrown solution. And he also did uh, mentioned some of the mandates of uh, organizations like NCDMB. Now, I want to point out four things that I think uh, we should really focus on, um, you know, as an industry. Number one is infrastructure. You know, we, we cannot exhaust technology and innovation uh, without, you know, really thinking about what is our infrastructure. Uh, do we have the infrastructure that can enable us operate uh, you know, efficiently on the back of big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Today, as we speak, the answer is no. So we have all manner of issues. I mean, uh, the other thing I want to mention, the second one is the policy and regulation. I think we have very obsolete policies, and I believe uh, during the uh, Q&A session, there will be more time to talk about this. Safety and security, Sherwood did touch on this. Honestly, uh, today we have pipeline vandaliz vandalization like Sherwood mentioned. Uh, we have, uh, we are supposed to be able to, you know, leverage on digital technology to monitor what is happening at the well site. But how many of the equipment that we install at the well site can we find, you know, days or weeks after? Then the fourth thing, and, and I want to just uh, peg it there for this one is, 
our lack of focus on awareness and uh, change management, uh, you know, or behavioral mindset of the workforce. Um, you know, uh, Prof. Adebulube did mention that knowledge drives innovation. If, if the knowledge is not well understood, uh, the, there's strong reluctance to, you know, to accept uh, innovative changes. You know, with all that is going on, there's a myth around, uh, you know, robots replacing employees. There's reluctance to embrace uh, digital technologies and uh, digital evolution. So, you know, th these four things, I think they are very critical in our conversation today around how we can achieve the form of evolution we need as an industry locally. Uh, so for us in Shlombuji, uh, being a service organization, our efforts usually are, are geared around helping our customers achieve cost savings and uh, of course uh, efficiency in their operations. And really one thing that has critically uh, shown that uh, we are not really mature for this is COVID-19. COVID-19 caught everyone unaware. The industry in Nigeria, uh, working from home became a new normal. Uh, business continuity was essential, but the, the industry was completely caught unaware and we are playing catch up now trying to do things uh, you know, remotely. But as an organization, we do have quite a lot of uh, solutions out there. We have remote operations, uh, which leverages technology to enable execution of services, not just, uh, you know, drilling or measure or measurement, but as well testing, logging, uh, you know, at the rig by employees who are not physically on the rig, but operating from somewhere else. And, and this has quite a lot of advantages around uh, safety uh, and of course, uh, you know, cost. The use of these two technologies uh, uh, has been uh, on the focus for us. It's, it's on the front burner. And recently we, we developed a platform called Delphi, a cognitive, secure and a cloud-based EMP uh, environment that has solutions across the EMP value chain. But adopting this uh, locally also has its own challenges which is around the, the four things that I mentioned. So we have to scale down in, uh, you know, in, in a more um, fit for purpose and adaptative, uh, you know, uh, fragments of this solution for our customers, such as, you know, having uh, the ability for secured uh, uh, access and, uh, you know, a remote, as remote secured access for our customers uh, through virtual execution of various solutions. Also helping our customers, um, you know, deliver projects remotely, uh, you know, leveraging on digital technologies, not without uh, the inherent challenges uh, that, that we have uh, today. And we all are in the same environment, so we understand what the challenges are. So I'll just leave it for, uh, you, know, at, at, uh, you know, there for now, and I'm hoping that we'll have more time to to talk about, uh, yes. you know, how we can really, uh, you know, get things going for us in Nigeria uh, during the Q&A session. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Because, uh, thank you very much to all the panelists uh, for your uh, very detailed opening remarks. Um, there's a bunch of questions already. I have about 20 questions on, on the list. Um, but let me just start um, with um, uh, you, Chiki, you know, since uh, you've been listening all this while, and a lot of the panelists um, made reference to your to your remarks. Um, and I want to start from the business to technology mapping. Um, during your keynote, you posed that question to the panelists, um, and you know, um, can we can you kind of give your own thoughts around what the barriers have been and what the uh, barriers to efficiency in this BTM has been? What do you see as barriers to adopting these new technologies that we've talked about in in the industry in general and then maybe in Nigeria in particular? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this very quickly, two perspectives, one from the international oil companies. Um, so these companies have their own research and development um, units. And these units only research on technology that impacts their business. So there's nobody doing any kind of um, just purely academic technical study. So if you look at all the advancements that you see, even things around uh, horizontal well logging technology, 
These were done in collaboration with universities and with international service companies. I know Baker and Slumberger at some time worked with the Shell R&D facility in putting together some kind of test components to test things with the uh, Technical University, TU Delft, I think, to test certain things about um, you know, the profile of production within horizontal wells. That's just an example. So the international companies have done this very well in terms of making sure that the technology that they're trying to adapt, and this technology is what we've seen over time. Yeah, this technology they're trying to adapt is related to their business, and they try to derive as much commercial value at an early stage from this technology. Um, so um, what we have seen happening is that uh, the indigenous participation, I'm coming to Nigeria, it's about adaptation. If you have not been involved in this uh, technology uh, research and development. You've not been involved in the innovation. So you don't actually know what the reasoning behind these IOCs driving this technology is, and yet you want to adapt it. And the only way you can adapt this is to also do your own business to technology mapping so that when you're going to apply technology, you do a beta test of the technology, a pilot test. Yeah, if it's already there, you don't have to invent the wheel, but you have to make sure that this technology does suit the environment of the resources that you have to develop. So the first thing I would ask is if you're in a marginal field, yeah, and you have a marginal field that has um, low contrast pay, which is my area of expertise. Yeah. Well, isn't that what you should be focusing on? Yeah. Should you be focusing your time on technologies that have no relevance to what you need to improve recovery in marginal fields with low contrast pay? Yeah. So that's the essence of business to technology mapping in terms of adaptation. Now, it is not only adaptation. The other part about it is what of indigenous research and development? We have, and we're talking about employing people. We have universities, we have service companies, indigenous service companies under the umbrella of PETAN or outside PETAN. And we have these independent producers. We belong to an independent uh, petroleum producers group, IPPG. Where is the collaboration between the service companies, the universities, IPPG, and the technology company in doing a proper business to technology mapping for what is important at the right cost to these companies. Yeah. So it's not all technology that will lead to robotics or anything like that. And you know, people ask about complexity. We need to simplify these things and make it relevant. That's the essence of BTM. BTM is not about complex solutions. It's about relevant technology solutions to business. Yeah. And I'd say if yeah. anything comes out of this yeah. conversation, it has to be, we have to start collaborating. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chike. Um, and I'll just use that as a segue to you, uh, Sheon, because um, I know during your talk, you spoke about, you know, just problems that you're having, and it's not just having technology for, you know, just doing great things, but, you know, if you have a problem like a pipeline vandalism, finding technology that will help with that. And so can you speak a bit more about you know, what technology do you see helping you solve the problems you have today and how has your, how has the organization been able to adapt or um, do some of this uh, BTM that we're talking about? Hello, everyone again. Uh, thanks, Femi. I, I did uh, uh, start the conversation already and I mentioned how uh, we looked at our own pinch points, uh, which are that First of all, we, there's not a lot of dynam, dynamic dynamism in the uh, m and workspace in Nigeria. Unlike other provinces, you don't get a lot of assets and properties coming into the market. So one of the first things we realize is that we have to get the best out of the portfolio we already have. That's one issue. Another issue I mentioned was um, getting our product to point of sale. Um, with these two problems in mind, our focus on the technologies we needed to adapt and adopt to survive were um, aerial surveillance or, ma um, or manned surveillance. Um, and purpose and where we looked at that was partnering with a te technology company looking at drones. We would like to use this and we have gone quite far in um, engaging our stakeholders uh, around the adoption of this technology 
to be able to help us reduce deferment, environmental impact and loss of value. So that is ongoing. Um, the other issue about uh, sweating our assets is that we have with our um, JV partner been pushing hard to do uh, deepening of existing development uh, through high pressure drilling and high temperature drilling so that we may be able to get um, near field uh, exploration that can come to production quickly. So these are the kind of things that we are doing uh, with regards to um, adoption of uh, indigenous technology. Uh, perhaps um, Mr. Chike was right. Uh, indigenous players need to collaborate more. And me through the cut amongst the pigeons here, one of the biggest problems that is now facing us indigenous companies uh, is um, the matter of gas commercialization and gas flaring. We all know that the, the latest penalties uh, are going to be uh, challenging for indigenous operators to deal with if we don't come together and collaborate and utilize technology to solve this problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your response. And since we're talking about policies and uh, gas flaring and, and, and the like, I want to come to you, Mr. Madasu, um, and ask you a question. And so, how how do we see technology playing a bigger role in in uh, in, in government? Uh, policy and regulation. Now, Prince even alluded to that a little in his talk that he sees that as uh, maybe one of the things we need to get right to be able to move to the next level with regard to technology. So I know you mentioned some of these things in your um, in your talk, but I want to kind of hear one or two more things that we're doing in terms of uh, technology application and how policies and regulations may be changing going forward. OK, thank you so much uh, for the question. Uh, like I said in my opening, um, we know that the industry is a highly cap capital intensive. Um, we also know that it's very dynamic, as we have, have said, you know, some of the speakers here. And so uh, technology adaptation, because of the high, huge costs that it brings on board, a lot of people are always very slow in adapting it because of um, the fear of failure because once you adopt technology and you fail um, is, is to pose a huge cost to, to your operation and um, we have seen in the industry before uh, taking the case of um, um, intelligent completion when it came and a lot of people went on it but because of so many reasons there were a lot of failures and then um, they have to backtrack uh, we in DPRO, we recognize all of all this, and that is why I said we have a section that have been dedicated to adapt new technology as they come on board. Like so, one of the speakers so said, technology that works in a particular place might not necessarily work because of other environmental factors and all that in another place. So when you are bringing technology to Nigeria, we have to uh, ensure sure that that technology that you are bringing on board will work in our environment. We have to ensure that the safety and, uh, and the safety is well taken care of. We have to ensure, the, of, of ensure that the functionality and the performance of that, of that technology across board, you know, is, is taken care of. So um, speedily, we, we look at all that. And uh, from what we have been having, uh, that has never been a challenge. But like some, somebody said, there is this low pace of adapting technology in the oil and gas industry because of awareness, not enough or a lot of awareness, because secondly, because of what most of the organizers, most of the operators, they are, they are focused, what their focus is. Some of them is just to use what they have, get what they need to get in terms of um, a, a, a profit and move on. Others want to adopt technology that will sustain their business for a long time. And so that is why if you look across the upstream value chain, the operators in the IOC, you constantly see technology, you constantly see them adopting technology because they have the financial uh, push, they have the research centers and all that. And so on the, in the indigenous, you don't see much of that. But like, like somebody said, these challenges are there. We need to start looking at them, adopt them, the issue of pipeline vandalism, um, 
there was no way to evacuate, so we had to quickly come up with uh, another method of trucking, of badging and trucking and all that. But um, I think we can do better too, like like one of the speakers said, if some of those smaller groups will have to come together um, or put a research, a research, um, a research uh, uh, together, it can be you know through the higher institution and all that, and also collaborate with governments. I think that is what I want to say. But from the operate from the regulator point of view, um, we are there to support. We have a unit that is looking at this ad adaptation, ensuring that whatever you are bringing is the one that will work in our environment, is the one that will provide the safety we need, also is the one that we work that is aligned to our regulation and international international best practices concerning that 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 technology. Okay, thank you, and thank you very much for that uh, response. And, and just to let the uh, panelists know, if if you have a an immediate follow up to a comment that has been made, uh, please just let me know and I'll give you the floor. Um, but just uh, moving on, um, you know, and, I, and you mentioned something like that. I think awareness is is very critical. But we have a question from Yusuf in the chat, and his question, uh, I guess, is a two-part question, if you will. Uh, I'll start with the first one. He says, why are the indigenous oil companies in Nigeria not investing in innovation? We keep borrowing technology from overseas without looking into technology that would be more suitable locally. And I think we've spoken a bit about this. Um, and I would um, kind of add another part to that question, and I'm, I'm directing this to you, Effie, and the other part of the question is um, technology and innovation can be costly to some organizations, um, especially maybe independents or smaller companies. How do you balance this cost of technology um, versus the value um, and, and, and in, in your company or in your own experience? Okay, uh, thanks, thanks for me. I, I think for me, it, if I reflect looking back now, um, it's about value and it's about horses for courses. Um, I've worked, I worked five years in Qatar developing GTL. GTL is very high technology and, and we're developing the, uh, you know, getting gas from this outpass, which is by 1,500 TCF of gas to build the biggest GTL plant in the world, processing 160,000 barrels of, of really high end uh, uh, GTL product using the Tropic Fisher process. So, so if I compare that now with also with uh, like when I run offshore, uh, shallow water and deep water, I mean, Bonga is, we all know, is one of the biggest assets in Port of Nigeria, you know, looking at almost 2 billion barrels recoverable oil, we've done about a billion before I left Shell. Uh, you then come to an independent kind of space where we're looking at very, you know, <laughs> age assets, uh, marginal fields, like uh, this keynote speaker mentioned, uh, lots of issues around, you know, uh, viscous crude, uh, and then a the big issue like uh, I think Sean talked about 2016-17 uh, when the Focado's uh, uh, export line was sabotaged, you know, that almost uh, led to a lot of independence being bankrupt, you know. So if you look at it, it, it the, the challenge I see is in the independent space, the, the, the challenges are kind of unique. They're very different from the IOC space. IOCs have huge portfolio globally. They can pool resources, work with a lot of uh, big organization, research institute, uh, uh, you know, service companies, and therefore they have a lot of weight which they can leverage on. We don't have that sort of privilege in the uh, in the independence. And don't forget, as a lot of independents uh, came out of, you know, were born from, you know, forming small companies, acquired assets from uh, the IOCs. And the first challenge is how do you actually finance those acquisitions? How do you raise capital? And then once you go through that process, how do you now finance even investment following up, which is why you see lots of independents struggling today to restructure the finances, uh, post the acquisition, all price collapse, and then the very high uh, uh, UOC you have in the Niger Delta, $20, $30 per barrel. So, so it's quite challenging, and I think the uniqueness of this challenge is makes it a bit difficult to then say you want to go local and begin to develop technology just for the sake of the fun of developing technology. If te technology doesn't bring uh, add value to the bottom line, you're not going to go on a quarterly market call. For example, company like Sepla, were listed in London and Nigeria. If you look at one of the issues, every quarter you got to report your financials, right? 
And I really can't stand before the market and tell the market because we're trying this technology, therefore we missed our earnings. You get hammered terribly for it with huge impact on, on your share price. So I think the, the challenges are quite unique, whether you're independent that's not listed or you're privately owned versus when you're, you're listed, where you go through more, more, more market calls, analysts are all making forecasts in terms of your projected earnings, all that will be displayed now. That's why it's, I think there's been probably slow pace uh, in terms of how we, the uptake in terms of uh, new technology. But the other part, we also tend to miss a lot. I think for independent, it's not even too much around technology. It's also around innovation, around supply chain. How do you actually spend all this capex? How do you drive down cost of capex? How do you source for materials at very lower cost through your supply chain management? And then even human resource, how do you actually hire talents? We don't have all the privilege like IOCs have with huge, you know, uh, uh, portfolio across the world to develop their talents. So our approach tend to be uh, quite different compared to the IOCs because of the unique uh, 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 challenges we face. Building on what Shell mentioned, every year I can tell you, independence lose between 30-40% of their production. Just imagine 30-40% to illegal, uh, to crude theft, to reconciliation losses. When I ran uh, deep water or shallow water, that was zero. There was zero loss due to theft or deferment because I put a gun boat around the FPSO and nobody there comes close to the FPSO. And you can't go down a thousand meters in Bonga, for example, to go and, you know, uh, break into the pipeline. So I think our uniqueness and our challenges uh, makes us, it makes it actually very difficult to, to be a bit bullish in terms of technology. Uh, but again, coming back to the point that was raised earlier on, I think that collaborative space is where we then need to really, really leverage on going forward to overcome some of these unique challenges which will face us independent, uh, Femi. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Efi. I think you're yeah, right. And I think a theme is, is somewhat building here. And I'm taking notes. Uh, we talked about uh, business to technology mapping, knowing what technology to use. Collaboration is, is critical between universities, indigenous companies. We need to partner together to be able to drive um, new technology in this space uh, and compete. Awareness is also critical as well, what I'm hearing. Um, but just to kind of change gear, Body, um, you spoke about your company and, and the business innovation uh, team. Um, how has that uh, helped you? And is there any other technology, um, or maybe I should rephrase that to say, um, what, what specific challenge uh, is that team addressing and how has it helped you? Thank you, Fabi. Yeah, so um, at Sahara, we operate across the energy value chain and from the upstream to the downstream and the power sector. And so what the team does is actually to look out for process improvement strategies. So they sit with the different teams, understand the nature of the business and understand what they would like to achieve and try to simplify the processes through which um, such is achieved. Um, I'll cite uh, an example. So you have in the in the downstream sector where basically you are looking out for um, customer behavior. You want to understand how the customer behaves, what makes the customer to buy. And then when you understand that, you deploy some process improvement and, and technology that aids the customer to be able to make quicker decisions and to be able to get um, product supplies across to them. So basically you have things that help to automate supply chain and reduce unit costs. So these solutions must be geared towards cost reduction, reduction in man hours that is spent on individual tasks and give value to the customer so that you can have a um, repeat purchase. In the power sector, um, you have um, them deploying solutions, which include um, making uh, automation of um, of um, recharge for electricity. Um, in the past, you have people who would have to go physically to get um, recharge for their um, meters. This has been automated by the team to make it easier for the customer to be able to um, purchase and um, electricity and power um, for their homes. And you have also in the upstream sector, uh, where before now we have um, cases where you have to do physical monitoring of your facility, 
you need to take your production volumes physically. The team has been able to come up with um, methodologies to automate this such that um, we're able to develop some ERPs for production reporting. Um, so the guy on the field doesn't necessarily have to do the physical activity for the guys in the office to get the reports and be able to take the decisions that needs to be taken with the data. To know if production is going down, to know if production is uh, sustained, to know what improvement we need to do. So those are some of the things that um, the business um, intelligence unit um, does. Basically, they're a team of innovators, a group of young guys who are enthusiastic and are crazy about technology. They're willing to try their hands on this thing. So those are the core of the team that we have. In the, in the upstream, um, some of the technologies we have been working on basically includes um, trying to see how we can optimize what we have currently and reduce capex. And so you have um, fields that are currently in production and then you have near field opportunity that requires you to potentially build a road and go and make a location to be able to assess that new drill site, to be able to exploit it. What do we do? We basically design some smart wells, which are long reach wells that are able to travel some three kilometers, crossing some major faults to be able to assess these hydrocarbons and be able to produce them from currently existing facilities, thereby dropping our capex significantly and also helping us to save a lot of time that would have been spent on location preparation and on, on, on road construction. Uh, in terms of collaboration, um, it is key that we continue to collaborate as an industry, most especially with the academia. Um, we have a lot of students out there who have not been opportuned to see what exactly it takes to work in the industry and they are into petroleum and the energy disciplines. Um, we have had a um, situation where we had research students who are willing to work with our data and we go into collaboration with service companies. Um, I have a particular example in seismic processing where we were able to identify um, a master's and a PhD research student who were willing to work on the data with the service company and they had some new algorithm that they wanted to test. And so the service company provided the, the hardware and the software to be able to try this out and when it became a success, um, these were applied onto our data, giving us some significant leverage as to imaging the subsurface um, to be able to see some of those missed hydrocarbons, which contribute to our short-term oil gains. Um, and the student is able to get some good research work done, get them published, which um, increases their morale and improves the the intellectual discourse um, that we have out there. So uh, that is something we need to continue to to, yeah, to leverage on. Yeah, definitely. All right, thank you. Thank you, buddy. Um, so I want to take a question from uh, one of our audience, uh, and it's from Rita. She says, there is a fear that using some of these technologies will result in job losses. What can people do to coexist with these technologies and remain relevant in the oil and gas industry. Uh, so Prince, I would like you to address this one. Okay, thanks Femi. Uh, I know I did touch about this on the, the, the importance of driving the uh, change mindset and the, uh, uh, you know, the importance of knowledge uh, in the industry as, as it pertains to Technology adoption. So uh, again, it's 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 not uh, uh, anything new that uh, we know that technology uh, driven by data analytics, machine learning, AI is here to stay. So, so do you agree uh, with they, the, they, they do you were agree fears. With the, uh, so Prince, I, I don't want to interrupt you. Do you agree with that statement that it will lead to job losses? So that is not, uh, that's not, that's a perception, okay? It's a perception, it's not true uh, in, in its entirety because what technology brings, it's uh, uh, overall cost savings and improved efficiency. 
for example, if we go to say a reservoir engineer or a group of uh, uh, PTEs uh, who spend weeks doing candidate screening, for example, uh, of to determine which, uh, you know, what type of well intervention will be done for their fields in order to ramp up production. That process, you know, requires some screening, requires ranking. It's very time consuming. But if you bring in technology, you can do it in hours. So the first perception would be someone's job is on the line. No, it shouldn't be. We, we need to draw the line between what technology uh, can do and what we as, you know, the most powerful beings on Earth, and that is our ability to use, uh, you know, to bring our uh, our knowledge, our, you know, strong uh, capacities into play in defining additional aspects of our workflows that we can enhance, checking for errors and ensuring that we are deriving the right level of efficiency from every technology. Yeah. So the, the time savings from whatever the machine has done can be invested into something else can be invested into looking at new opportunities. Okay. It doesn't mean that that person or the, the, the uh, engineer shouldn't have a job. The thing we should be asking ourselves is what other skills does the engineer require in order to do additional aspects of the job? Today, you can't sit solo tight and say, I'm a reservoir engineer. All I do is, uh, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, just, just running. From what, what other, what other aspects, what other skills do you need to be relevant in the days that we are in? Yeah. So that's not entirely true. We just need to take uh, the positives and build ourselves, increase competencies, build skills, and diversify uh, in other areas so that we can be more, uh, more productive in our organizations. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I want to get uh, one or two other perspectives on this because I think it's a it's a good uh, topic and a lot of people are, are worried about this. So, uh, Mr. Chike, uh, do you mind weighing in, weighing in on this uh, topic? Do we think uh, jobs will be lost and what what skills? Because Prince talked about uh, new skills that can be developed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this has always been uh, the problem with the uh, advances in technology. At every initial stage, there's always been um, an argument. There are some cranks, there are some crank arguments about what new technology will do in terms of destroying the world. And the other concerns, which are valid concerns usually about new technology and employment. But let me ask you, and so I'm throwing a question back, through the course of history, what do you think new technology has done with respect to employment, apart from improving and increasing the employment capacity of industry? That's what is done. And basically, the only thing that people need to take on board is that they need to then challenge themselves about reskilling. It's about what are the new skill sets you will need. The skill set that Slumberger brothers had are not the same skill sets that petrophysicists or reservoir engineers or production engineers have today. And therefore, the petroleum engineers of the future, and I ask you, I urge you to go and read the JPT um, edition that talked about the new engineers of the future. So the skill set that the new engineers of the future need has to be the skill set that has to do with all the conversations going on here. Internet of things, big data, analytics. So it's about reskilling. If you don't reskill, of course, every industry, if you don't reskill when technology is moving, you don't get a job. But if you reskill, the opportunities are immense. For people. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to add as well. Uh, me. Go ahead. So, so maybe I'll just chip in just to build on Prince and uh, Chickas. So I, I tend to look at analog. So if you look at uh, the uh, e-commerce B2B world, look at Amazon today, uh, look at collapse of brick and mortar, so traditional shops in the developed world. Uh, also, if I look at what Airbnb has done and also uh, Uber, and I did mention that are we still going to remain a oil and gas company or more of a technology company? You've got to think about it. It's a completely different mindset. If you take companies like Tesla, 
They actually, Tesla is actually a technology company. It's not really, a, you see them make cars, but the issue is not really cars, it's technology. So that's why I think I agree that clearly we, don't, we will not need uh, the kind of skills which uh, people had before. But the beauty about this is this is to drive down costs, to make a lot of investment opportunities become more attractive compared to what we have today. And that will open up new opportunities. Clearly, I still see a lot of employment opportunity in my view looking forward. It's just that the kind of skill set you need, the ways of working with all this digital transformation is going to be completely different from what you have today. And that's what we've seen companies like Amazon taking over a brick and mortar or you look at Uber or, or look at uh, companies like Tesla. So I think that that concern generally each time I have town halls with staff or talk to people. I even have a younger, uh, small nephew who's about getting to invest into petroleum engineering that's asking me, can it really do petroleum engineering? The, <laughs> the oil world is coming to an end. It's all a Magidon. I don't agree with that. I think there's going to be even far more exciting, challenging opportunities for people as against those days when you had people go working very remote location. They can actually sit in the office on a desktop and do lots of stuff which people normally do like uh, the guy from Orlando mentioned earlier on. So that's my yeah. own perspective. Okay, thank, thank you very much. And I think these comments have answered like four or five questions that that come that came through through the chat. A question from Marvelous was, uh, what is the hope of young professionals in Nigeria in advancement of uh, production in the oil and gas section um, sector? And so you talked about it, we need to retool, we need to rescale. Um, thank you. And so I, I want to segue here. So if I am going to come to you now, um, you spoke earlier about not just focusing on adding barrels, but also looking at uh, costs. Um, and so can you speak a bit about uh, what uh, technology you're applying or, or what your own thoughts are around technology and how we can focus on costs and not just increasing barrels? All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Femi. So clearly in in the domain where, where we are, one of the things that increased the unit operating cost for most of the independents is security. And then also you need, the other thing that also makes it very difficult is by the time 40% of your production is, is, uh, uh, is undergoing crude death, uh, you're not able to account for it at the end of the day. Yes, you've taken it out of the reservoir, but it's not in your, it's not being accounted for in your bottom line. Uh, then your unit cost jumps up because that unit cost is a, is a function of your total barriers and, and, and your total cost. So one of the things that we've done as a company is not, we haven't, it wasn't, you wouldn't say it's a technology solution, but you would say it's an innovation. For instance, we, we have moved uh, evacuation systems uh, completely. Uh, 85% of our crude right now is being evacuated from with marine badges. Uh, it's, it's classical uh, technology that has been there. It's not frontier technology, but we've integrated all of those technology into a solution that is innovative. Uh, so this conversation is, as, as we say, some of the technologies that is emerging on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the IOCs may need, may have need that they're using to evolve those. But there are some that we need to continue to look at inward and say, what are the combination of systems that we can use to create value, uh, which everyone has said very clearly, uh, business to technology mapping. So one of the things we did uh, in our company is by the time we had the shutdown or the, uh, the Focado's terminal outage for over 16 months, that that we sat down and then looked at our evacuation systems once again, and then gave gave rise to what we call now alternative evacuation, which is essentially uh, taking quite building a jetty and then taking quite some kind of amount of our uh, crude from from the uh, swamp down to the uh, uh, offshore where our FSO is located. So that's that's what we're doing. But the other the other thing ways to reduce reduce costs is to continue to uh, challenge our teams clearly that this is a, this is not a system as someone has mentioned very clearly that is not a time when you say you're a p-tech or a reservoir engineer and then you just sit in your cubicle uh, you, we, we're looking for uh, team members with multi-skill and have also the capacity for 
learning transfer because those are the only people that can uh, adapt and survive the uh, the current change. But the question is not really about with technology uh, cost job losses. It's inevitable that we have to evolve. It's inevitable. It's not it's not an option. It's not luxury. Uh, it is a question of what are the things that I need to evolve myself uh, in that in that space. Uh, and it's about value. Some of mentioned value. If, if the, what the technology is going to do is that if it's driving my recovery factor from the 40 percent to the 60 percent to 75 percent, then we are creating value. So it's creating increased value. It's about the, the bigger good. It's not if you look at it in a very micro system, uh, you will only be seeing job loss. But what it does is that this, we using more data, we using more data mining capabilities. The people are able to increase, generate opportunities that will help you increase your recovery factor, which is value that would have otherwise been left in the ground, but you're then bringing it up to the surface. So it is to change that mindset to think in a much bigger scale than a very micro scale that will cause you begin to think in, in terms of job losses. Okay, all right. Thank you. So we're still kind of cycling back to the issue of people. Um, and so, Shemo, I'm going to come back to you for, for a second. So um, sticking to this theme of, of people, um, having technology is one thing. And in my experience, I've seen that you would bring tech, but the people that you are expecting to use it are, are old school, for, for lack of a better word. So we talk about the aging workforce in, in oil and gas. How do you think this will play out? How do we retool um, people? How do we improve people? Or do we need to hire a new set of people to be able to move um, in this technology and innovation uh, um, space? Thanks, Femi. Uh, that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> at a, yes, it is. At, a, at one of our town halls, our principal said something to us. He told us, innovate or die. This was um, not long after some issues we had been uh, we had been experiencing. What he was trying to do there was appeal to our sense of survival. Everybody wants to survive. So it's been touched upon it by some panelists. It is key that um, we embark on a campaign to change the mindset of those who are the older or not just older individuals who may be worried that adoption of technology somehow presents um, a risk to them. Um, someone mentioned the Kodak moment and, um, you know, any, no, no, even with the inelastic demand, apparent, in, well, I can't even say that anymore, given what's going on. What appeared to be inelastic demand of, of oil, um, we, we, could get, we could go extinct if we do not continue to innovate and find a way to deliver um, energy to the globe uh, to develop cheaply, safely, and in an environmentally friendly way. One of the things, besides, you know, changing the mindset um, from micro level to micro level, we should also consider diversity. Like you mentioned, we have an aging workforce, and whether we like it or not, uh, the millennials and the younger generation are better versed uh, because they've basically grown up in that era, uh, adopting technology, I think that companies need to look at their recruitment strategies um, about how they bring in young people, people who are interested and know about technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, so that they can come in and disrupt business and put forward new ideas that let the business uh, businesses innovate and grow. So to wrap to wrap my um, response, so these are soft issues. Uh, uh, and those are my proposals for how you know um, the industry should consider dealing with it. All right, thank you, thank you very much for your response. So I'm, I'm going to change gear a little. We have a question from Folao, and I want to di direct this to you, Mr. Madasu. Um, the, the question goes like this: it says, how do you integrate this low oil cost regime with other sources of energy, such as wind uh, and solar, uh, that are becoming more affordable? And so as, as uh, someone representing the regulators, in a sense, um, what are we thinking in, in that direction? OK, thank you so much um, for that question. Um, if you follow the, the policy in the industry, 
you will agree with me that yeah, 2020 uh, was uh, declared as a year for gas. And so um, we understand that that energy balance is beginning to change, changing from being oil, oil to oil, gas. And now we are not talking of gas, gas, gas. And in one of the opening remarks of one of um, the speaker, if he, he talk about what supply is doing concerning gas and all that. We understand that and in in-house in as a regulator, we have also created some uh, a unit that is looking at um, energy mix, looking at new energy, yeah. such that we begin to look ahead and begin to develop regulation that we take care of that. We don't want to wait until that time and then uh, we are caught napping. I have also told you when I started in my remark that as the 20 DPRO in the 21st century is not the way it used to be. We are thinking ahead. So we have seen this and we are we are well positioned. We are we are already looking at generating uh, policy, looking at generating guideline regulation, you know, to take care of that. I think that is what I want to say now. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chike, what, what are your thoughts in, in terms of that as well? Um, we talk about the energy mix, energy transitions and this current environment and, you know, we're talking about technology now. Uh, so, I want to kind of hear your thoughts on how this uh, technology innovation in oil and gas, how that marries with this new push uh, for new energy, if you will. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, maybe um, this time I'll talk about what uh, my company, Walter Smith Petroman, is actually doing because it's, um, uh, let me just use a, 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 a vernacular phrase, talk na do. So um, mm -hmm. we're building an industrial complex, an industrial city in Imo State. And um, part of what we're trying to do is to make sure that we're able to transition properly uh, from what we now know as fossil fuels into more renewable sources of energy. Our partners in this journey are UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, who you all well know are driving the sustainable development goals along the lines of building industrial capacity that is sustainable. Now, how does this involve, um, you know, uh, Nigeria and, you know, what we're talking about today about technology? All the technology that we're bringing into that industrial city will be top class technology driven by what is happening now. So expect 5G, 6G to be deployed there. We'll have an ICT center, which will be there to do research and development and deploy all new technologies in different industrial areas. So that industrial complex will have a manufacturing sector, petrochemicals, pharmaceuticals, agro-based industry and, and the lot. And we'll also have an ICT center that will help to do research and development to improve these manufacturing areas and then to also support the transition from about let's say roughly 300 megawatts of fossil fuel based power gas power to about a thousand megawatts in the first phase of solar power so we do see that energy mix changing it will not immediately drop out gas gas will be one of the fossil fuel energy sources that will last for quite a long time principally because it's cleaner than oil and coal. But we do see that in the next maybe 50 years, half a century, century, we need to start deploying more renewable sources of energy. Firstly, because the technology advancements are there to significantly reduce the cost of this energy. And you know, secondly, because this is sustainable. And therefore, anybody who is thinking about the oil and gas industry and thinking that we're going to stay the same way, so it's no longer oil and gas industry, I like what Effie said, it's a tech industry. But can I modify that a little bit? It's an energy technology industry and no longer just for fossil fuel. So that is the transition that has to happen. And Walter Smith is on the journey to showcase that that can happen in Africa as well, because it has happened all places in the world. You need to have some examples. Why not here? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I'm learning, uh, I thought we are coining new terms or I'm learning new terms. So. We are transitioning into an energy tech industry. I like that. And so I, I want to come to you, Bode, with a question from one of our participants. So Mayawa um, asks, he says, over the past few years, we've had a huge outbreak in of startup tech firms in Nigeria. What are the synergy strategies put in place by 
EMPs and regulators to ensure we leverage on these local expertise in driving technology and innovation in Nigeria, in the Nigerian oil and gas industry, instead of solely relying on foreign technology expertise. And I know, Bode, you, you talked about having young guys in, in, in your business innovation hub or your business intelligence unit. Uh, so can you speak to this question around how are we creating synergies uh, with uh, this uh, uh, startup tech in Nigeria? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, this is something that is um, at the heart of what Sahara does. Um, we are involved in a couple of um, talent programs where what we do is go out to look for talent. Um, we have an um, organization who runs such um, programs and then we provide the resources for them to be able to and cater to the people who are on such programs. I'm trying to remember the exact name of um, one of such programs. But then internally, what we'll do is every year we have a graduate recruitment program across the different sectors where we identify people we call intrapreneurs who have the skills to work as entrepreneurs but within an organized system and then we help them to structure their ideas and structure their talent to be able to fit the modern day um, requirement. Um, so that is how we help some of these startups. We have um, programs where um, startups are put through a mentoring program where, in, where industry people are linked with startups to provide mentoring on how to run their businesses to be able to attain the multinational status that they most likely desire to, to, to attain. So these are some of the things that, that we do. I would also like to speak to the part of um, the unattractiveness of the industry to the younger generation. Yes, when you engage with students and campuses today, you will see that the fear is there. But then there is something that remains constant in our industry. There is a technological aspect and there is a knowledge part of it. As a geoscientist, if you know how to use a software, you need to know the local geology of the area where you work. So it is something to have the technology to work with. It is another thing to have the intrinsic knowledge of your geology and what works, what does not work, what to look out for, to be able to deploy this technology. So we will continue to need people to run these technologies that we are bringing on board and to work the innovations that we are bringing on board. So the, the, the horizon is good. There are still a lot of opportunities in the industry for the younger ones to tap into. For those who are in the industry who are the young professionals, yes, we need to retool. We need to know what the trends are in the industry and how to be able to adapt yourself, to be able to take advantage of the new trend and to remain relevant um, within the, the EMP industry. Um, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Bodhi. Great, thank you, great, great answer. Um, like uh, Professor Adebunwe said in his opening remarks, we need the knowledge which leads to innovation, which leads to productivity and um, ultimately business results. So thank you for that uh, response. So, Effie, I want to come to you with a question from, from our audience as well. And so this is from uh, David Cromwell. Um, he says, it seems the problem with the industry has been, has been technology and te technological advancements that uh, produce more barrels of oil, but at a higher cost. Uh, you suppose looking digitally, uh, but these technology also accrue their additional costs um, I guess I guess that's the point of that. So we said, does, doesn't it seem like we're continuing this trend? Will these technologies that we're talking about make operations leaner, or are they just more sophisticated tools that uh, inadvertently drive costs higher? So are we solving the problem, or are we just, you know, uh, beating around in the wind? Okay, thanks, Femi. I think if you look at technology, you know, you start with the IR, IR and D first, innovation R and D, before you then go to pilots and then deployment. And there's a whole phase of how you deploy deploy technology. You indeed write that initially it can be quite expensive when you go for trials. 
to, I mean, a lot of companies spend so much money developing technology. The value then comes when you then begin to deploy, right? The more you deploy, you get learnings and you fine tune the technology, you then start realizing the value down the line. Uh, so, so our own, my reflection again, looking at the example I gave Aaron with, with uh, Seplat, like I said, we're very big on gas. So the first gas plant we built in Oban was very much based on Joel Thompson, which is very common in the industry. But you can only use JT if you have very high reservoirs that are still at virgin uh, pressure. When you go to depleted reservoir, like we're seeing in, in, in Sapelet now, we're deploying a mechanical refrigerant unit sort of technology, which is quite different because you're looking at uh, depleted reservoirs against a uh, high pressure reservoir. So initially, that onset of, of the R&D space uh, it's, it can be quite expensive, like I said earlier on. Uh, the value then comes in you can, if you can deploy more and get more global acceptance. And I think that's a challenge which I think companies like us, independents, uh, do face. Because like we earlier mentioned, first we don't collaborate uh, among ourselves very well, so it makes it a bit difficult then to, to drive down that cost. But you really cannot rely on one party driving technology and expecting the cost will go uh, go down over time. And it's the same whether you look at logging technology like GK just went through. Even wells, we started drilling horizontal wells back then, I remember, and then also multilateral. Initially, it was very, very expensive. If you look at deep water today, we drill wells in deep water for less than 50, 60 million dollars. When I was running deep water, initially, I remember a deep water well used to cost over 100 million, 120, 150 million dollars to drill one, one deep water well. But as investment went in technology and then deployment, and then over time, you then see a lot of um, uh, followers then come in and they become much more cheaper. So, but yeah. for Nigeria in particular, I think you've got to be able to distinguish or to break down the cost, the high cost you see. Like earlier mentioned, a lot of it is due to non-technical risks, community, vandalization, security costs, you know, issue around, you know, losses are across the pipeline, like I think a lot of my colleagues in the independent world did mention before. And that's why for us, our approach to, is not just technology, it's more around actually innovative thinking as it, against just technology. But it's an area which we'll have to really do a lot of work on because otherwise, if it's, if it's rising cost, then it doesn't really bring the bottom line value like to see in your profit and loss or balance sheets at the end of the day. Thank you. All right, thank you, Effie. Thank you, Effie. And I think that's a good segue to some of these uh, additional comments and questions I'll, I'll take now. And so I'll just read out what I think is more of a comment. So, Charles, does the industry have a platform on their website that shows encountered field challenges so as to engage interested applicants or research institutes in providing solutions? And I think this is something that we've talked about. Collaboration is key. Um, uh, to make this work, especially in the Nigerian space. And so I have a question also from uh, from the chat group uh, from Preye Orodu, who says, is the oil and gas industry really interested in domesticating R&D? We have untapped resources and talents in our universities, and uh, I would like Prince uh, to take a stab at this one. Okay, thanks Femi. Um, I think the interest is there. Uh, however, we are just uh, too slow. Uh, in, I think it was in September or November, I don't remember precisely the day, there was uh, a symposium organized by the Nigeria Academy of Science, here in which uh, I, I did attend. And they pulled together stakeholders from, uh, from the universities, uh, from the industry, from the government, uh, Nigeria Bureau of Statistics were there, and uh, you know, quite an extended uh, audience. Now, it was amazing the level of work that a university like Unilag is doing around uh, big data and uh, artificial intelligence, because that workshop was all around uh, big data and AI. So. There, there, there is the interest. There, there's a lot that is going on, but really what we're missing is uh, a platform to pull together all the resources and all the efforts. And, uh, you know, we've talked about collaboration, but there's, there also needs to be inclusiveness. You know, we are not inclusive enough uh, in, the, in the sense that we, we, we choose who to collaborate with. So if we can have and this is where policies really drive things. 
if there can be a deliberate policy driven by the right uh, government agency and having a will and uh, you know the honesty to make things work i think we will really uh, go far so uh, i'll just like to keep it there uh, it's it's happening at different uh, at different scales but we just need the, the resources and the platform to pull this all together. You know, Chike did talk about NCDMB driving r and efforts. We've worked with them, uh, you know, at a certain level. They're supposed to be, they, they've had one workshop and they're supposed to be another workshop pulling together all the stakeholders in the industry. But again, there are gaps because we need the universities, we need the academia in all this. So inclusiveness uh, and, uh, you know, Extended reach of stakeholders engagement is very important. Thanks. Thank you, which is uh, back to that uh, collaboration thing we we're talking about. Every time yeah. I hear you say policy or anybody says policy, I want to defer to uh, Mr. Adamada to, to make one or two comments. Um, and so I guess a, a question for you, sir, is that uh, is it possible to, to think about policy to drive technology and drive this collaboration and maybe make it mandatory for IOCs and indigenous companies to partner with universities, for instance. So just wanted to get your thoughts on that, Mr. Marasu. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, I I would agree with the last speaker. I think it's, it's possible uh, for everyone to come together to, to put all of all this together. Uh, one, there is need for us to work with the, with the institutions with the academics. But what we have seen is everybody working on their own. Um, the, 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 the technology that an IOC will bring will be different from the other one. So they don't want to share it and they don't want to integrate it. But like you said, I think it's, it's something that we need to take back as, as a regulator and see how we can evolve a policy, you know, on daily basis, we think, like I said before, um, we look at new things, new trends, new ideas that is coming up in the industry, and then we try to see how we can work around them. I think it's a good one. Um, how we already are doing that anyway, but in terms of bringing everybody together to do research together, to come up with with new way of doing things, maybe that's what we have not been doing. We encourage operators. To share their assets, to share their their uh, you know where they need to get advantage advantage in order to reduce costs like 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 the issue of um, when we had the issue of pipeline vandalism where we had to mandate some operators to engage other smaller ones to be able to share from um, help them to evacuate their crude. But in terms of putting deliberate policy, the deliberate regulation that will be endorsed by both the national assembly government such that all the operators would not have to uh, bring them together to 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 come out with that that we have to drive the industry i think it's something we need to to take back and then um I work with MCM, MC, mcdmb is doing something but i think they also need to involve other regulators gpro nlpc because we have a research group already in nlpc and if we have an ro and D that is already looking at the working with the PSC, the JV, then there is need for everybody to come together, uh, the DPRO, the NLPC, the NCDMB, and other operators and other regulators also looking at the environmental side so that we can evolve a policy, a policy that we integrate all of all this together. Okay. Well said. Well said, sir. I appreciate Femi, that. I was going to add something, Femi, just one. So I think just to build on that, the point I was going to add was uh, the, the issue around global competitiveness. I think we we'll have to realize that what the earlier, the question you asked around the, the younger people from the university, we've got to realize that that industry, energy industry is a globally competitive landscape and there's really no entitlement. And if I listen to what Chiki mentioned around Petan and what the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what's it called, what NCD is doing, and also the entire ecosystem, like Amada just referred to, is about policies, it's about regulatory framework, it's about talent, is you can see that an ecosystem, but the bottom line is that entire ecosystem doesn't deliver competitiveness. There is no way we will make any progress. You ask yourselves, why did Dangote go to India to bring in fitters and welders to come and build the refinery is building in Lagos here? 
Are you guys with me? So yeah. we've got to begin to ask ourselves very, very difficult questions around this whole issue, around developing skills that are relevant to power the economy. Today, what we see, even coming out of our universities, are not graduates that are actually, that are actually have been taught in such a way that they can adapt to the business challenges we have. And therefore, we end up going to Imperial College or to you know go to university abroad to hire people. So I think we all need to change uh, in terms of our mindset, in terms of our competitiveness, in terms of recognizing that in a globally competitive world, capital allocation, investment coming into Nigeria will have to compete with other parts of the world. Otherwise, nobody's going to bring money here to invest. Government cannot raise money, they don't have money because we're not competitive. So those are sort of thought-provoking things we've got to start asking ourselves as a nation. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, just 30 seconds. Femi, just 30 seconds on that. Uh, something I want to add around that is that it's also important that as we discuss local technologies that we begin to steer our mind not to go the route of reinventing the wheel, but rather look yes. at how we can leverage existing technology to create innovative solutions for our specific challenges. I think that mindset be a more value-adding mindset and a mindset of going around to invent, reinvent the wheel. Just using existing technology to adapt innovative solutions to our, our local challenges. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Ifani. Uh, so uh, time is fast spent. Uh, I appreciate the discussion. I want to especially thank uh, our moderators on the chat group. I see that they are responding to some of those questions online. Uh, so thank you for that, Mr. Chike, Effie, and, and all those that have responded online. And so um, I've heard a lot of themes coming through in our conversation as I try to wrap up, you know, um, how, how we need to have knowledge. It's not just about tech, knowledge of the the underlying, uh, underlying industry um, is important. Knowledge leads to innovation, which leads to productivity that we're talking about. We talked about BTM. We talked a lot about collaboration. We talked about awareness and trying to create a, a mindset change. We talked about value being the key um, and not just uh, technology for technology's sake. We have to make sure it drives value. Um, so I think those are important things. Another thing that stuck with me was uh, policy can help drive some of these things that we're looking for and that we need to put all these things together to create an energy technology industry that we will all be proud of uh, going forward. So thanks again to all the panelists. I want to give, uh, I know time is fast spent, I want to give each of us about 30 seconds to uh, give our final thoughts. Uh, just one thing, a question, that, a question that came to my mind is, you know, where do you, what, what do you want to see in 10 years? What, what is the thing, one technology you'd like to see implemented or where do you see um, us being in 10 years in terms of technology. But anyway, um, you are free to give your final thoughts. So I want to start with um, with you, Sheung. Thanks, Femi. My final thoughts are that technology is accessible to anybody. Technology and innovation should not be seen as something esoteric, but critical to the success of any technical company. And, and that we are already seeing the seeds of indigenous uh, R&D um, I was fortunate to attend an exhibition in 2019 by um, NCDMB's um, R&D uh, uh, arm and we were, our minds were blown by what was being done in Nigeria and universities and by uh, private uh, sector. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, Buddy, can you give your final thoughts briefly? Thank you. So the era of the cheap oil finds are gone. Um, the remaining hydrocarbons are difficult to find. If there is one technology I would like to see out there in the near future to be something that helps us to improve our recovery factor from existing reservoirs. You know that we have the stock oil tank initially in place and we're only able to recover a fraction of what is there. So if we can have technology that is able to improve our recovery factor, that would be really fine. The other thing is, um, the guy that asked the question on startups. So I see that a lot of um, um, innovators attending this conference. Um, so as we cannot employ everybody in the industry, uh, who those we convert to intrapreneurs, we have the extrapreneurs. So there is a site that we call the Sahara Hub. It has over 11,000 um, people on the platform now, and it is basically for startups and people who are interested in entrepreneurship 
tech startups and the likes, you can go to the platform, you'll find a lot of wonderful resources that helps you to build a business, implement structures, and gives you advantage and leverage to some of the companies so that you can grow your ideas. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Pune. Uh, if I can we have your final thoughts, please? All right, I would like us to see technology as an essential. Uh, we are in an energy competitive business. Uh, if our industry doesn't leverage technology to drive down, as Chiki has shown, uh, cost per kilowatt hour, uh, other energy sources will, will run us over and will basically be, is, is an existential challenge that we all have to use technology to see how, how long we can stay here. All right, thank you, Femi. Uh, Prince, can we have your final thoughts, please? Who, me, or who's next? No, oh, Prince. Prince okay. okay. All right, thanks, uh, Femi. Uh, I would just want to uh, touch on one thing, and, you know, in closing, uh, you know, we're talking about technology and innovation. Uh, this is very much driven around people. So I think uh, there is need to start investing in uh, knowledge, the, getting people at the knowledge level and the competency level they need to be, uh, and this will drive overall change of mindset. So we, we need to continuously focus on on uh, you know driving for you know competency improvement. And again, uh, for us to really achieve collaboration, because most of the uh, most of the talk around the cost of technology is really because we are looking at the short term. Uh, but to achieve the value of technology, we need to look long term. And one of the challenges that has that has hindered uh, long term engagement is lack of integrity and trust. So we, we need to start rewriting our history as Nigerians, uh, businessmen. Uh, you know, our history on integrity issues. The more we, 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 we demonstrate that we show the right level of integrity in our business dealings, the more, you know, robust engagement there would be uh, for the long term. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prince. Uh, Effie, you're up next. Okay. Uh, three, three final ones for me. First is around... Um, uh, technology and innovation is actually at the core of our business. We really can't, this business will be dead, like it was mentioned earlier on, without technology and innovation. I think what needs to change in my view going forward is around, we've got to keep an open mind and learn a lot from the other industries. We've seen some of those already from the military. We picked up uh, the drones, which is really a military aviation sort of technology. So we've got to look a bit uh, external to the medical industry on imaging, to tech companies around how do you work with big data, you see what uh, all these B2B or B2C uh, companies have done. So that first thing, we've got to think a bit uh, outward. Second for me is around driving innovation, um, not think about just recovery factor or maximizing production or, 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 initial, or potential of wealth is a function of so many variables. So you got to drive, put that same passion in terms of how you're driving technology in the surface, subsurface, also into your finance, also into your SCM world. Because if you cannot raise finance through innovative method, then you cannot drive down your weighted, weighted average cost of capital. So that's one thing. Think about tech and innovation across your full spectrum. The third one for me is to encourage startups. Uh, we've got to take risk, fail, like they say, take risk, fast fail forward, right? So working with startups locally, how we do a lot with some small startups around uh, blockchain technology, around WRFM, the company you know very well, like Cyber Christian, we're doing lots of stuff with them as well. So we've got to encourage all these startups, which then becomes, uh, they also work on uh, fixed stock from universities to also hire lots of very, very young talent. I think together there's a whole bright future, in my view, for, for industry to make those world moves. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Madison, your final comments, please. Okay, thank you so much um, once again. I think my last word, I'll start with yes, first, as uh, operators, uh, it will be better for us to um, do collaborative research, especially for the indigenous, so that they'll be able to come up with something that will drive uh, innovate, innovation. 
if they cannot adopt a lot of the technology because of the huge cost, even though you see that, you know, uh, leave, you, leave, you get that um, leverage on a long term. But to cap all of all this technology innovation, most of the time, you have to build appropriate regulation, appropriate guideline, appropriate policy around all of all this. And the department is where pools, uh, we have built capacity to do all of all that, looking at the future and developing appropriate framework to take care of this uh, innovation and technology. Thank you so much. All right, th thank you. Uh, and finally, uh, Mr. Chike, can you close us now? Yes, thank you, you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, two areas. So, um, first of all, technology that we need to apply now and maybe in the next 10 years. Drone technology, we need to start deploying that in Nigeria. This is not rocket science. It's around surveillance of our pipelines and our infrastructure with respect to deterrence. They can act as deterrence as well. Because while we talk about all these ultimate recovery and everything, even if you can produce more oil, if you cannot transport it through the pipeline systems, it makes no commercial sense to continue to produce. So that's one area. The second area I'd like to see in the future is around um, big data analytics. And it's about um, transparency. I use the word transparency because that's the other major cost uh, this thing in Nigeria. I'd like to see a system of fisc a fiscal system that is adaptable to uh, Sorry, fiscal system that is adaptable to the oil and gas industry. One that is, uh, how do I put it, innovative and mobile, not controlled by government. So I'd like to see a situation where all the information around regulations, uh, the PIB, whatever, is contained in one big data space, call it a cloud, and where effectively everybody it is transparent what each party is doing, both from the point of view of the investors and from the point of view of government and regulators. I'd like to see that all encompassing system that delivers transparency that will bring down costs. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chike and, and the rest of the panel. So, um, panelists, uh, that brings us to the end of this uh, panel session. I thank you all for the questions. I thank you all for the comments. Um, I would hand over now to uh, Michael, I believe, who will give us uh, a vote of thanks. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you, Femi. Thank you, Femi. Thank you so much. Wow, I'm speechless. Such a um, fantastic session. Um, Michael, I'll hand over to you briefly. Just let me say a few words, okay? All right. So, all um, right. yeah, I just want to say to our speakers, you all, we are definitely amazing. Thank you so much. We are top notch and you gave your all. We really, really, really appreciate all the insights that you all shared with us. I'm sure I echo, you know, the other participants to say that you guys did a great job. You finished the topic. Thank you so much. So as we are short of time, I will quickly just put out the word, a word there, um, especially to both young and old. That, oh no, I mean, it's been said over and over. We need to retrain. We need to acquire skills as pos as many as possible to remain relevant. So wherever it is you need to go to get the skills, then you better run there just like me to get the skills. Secondly, I also want to say I also want to say kudos to our government, represented by our regulator, Mr. Madosu. Thank you for sharing with us that you know um, this um, technology is being discussed and you're engaging the operators. We do hope in the future, in the near future, to see more traction, especially around uh, uh, you know some of the policies we are making to ensure you know it encourages more development towards uh, making our industry an energy technology industry. And finally, um, just listening to the speakers, it's um, obvious that uh, we are headed in the right direction. And uh, even though we recognize there's still some work to be done, but we are obviously we're headed in the right direction. So thank you so much. That was the end of the panel session. Um, I'll quickly hand over to Michael, who will give us a vote of thanks, and then LNC comes afterwards to talk us through the remaining plans for the activities we have for the week. And once we are done, like I mentioned at the beginning, we will proceed um, for our one hour break. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Michael, you have the floor now. Okay, thank you very much, um, Uju. 
Um, it's been a powerfully packed session. The past three hours has been explosive. Um, I'm Michael Yiri, uh, the program's chair for um, the Lagos section. And um, I would like to um, thank all the stakeholders that have been involved in delivering this um, hugely successful um, technical symposium. Um, we really appreciate you all. Um, right through um, from the keynote speech down to the moderator and all the way to the panelists. Um, you all have been really, really great. I mean, there was uh, not, no better time to discuss um, such a sensitive topic than um, where we find ourselves now within the industry. So this is really a time for us to um, embrace the takeaways out of this and make sure we um, the industry bounces back. Um, I would especially like to thank um, Mr. Chike um, for his time and um, bringing his wealth of experience. Um, the legal section and indeed the whole participants, thank you very much for this. Um, I would also like to appreciate the moderator, Mr. Femi. Thank you very much for a good job well done. Um, our panelists, our distinguished panelists, um, from um, Mr. Amadasu to Mr. Okun, to um, Mrs. Ajayi, um, ably represented by Matthew, um, Mr. Idiria, also represented by Prince, um, Mr. Ifan Izuka, and um, the dynamic lady on the panel, um, Mrs. Shion Solanke. We really, really appreciate you. Uh, also, in a special way, I'd like to appreciate um, our sponsors for this event, um, Green Energy International Limited, um, Mr. Pro uh, Professor uh, Anthony. We really, really appreciate you. Thank you so much for partnering with the Lagos section to deliver this um, um, symposium. Thank you very much. Um, we would also like to appreciate all our participants logged on from across the world. Thank you very much for choosing to spend um, your time with SPE and we will hope that you have learned um, one or two things. Um, without um, leaving this platform, I would also want to, in a very special way, recognize um, the planning committee for uh, an absolute job well done. Thank you very much from all the board members to the volunteers um, that have made this turnout um, exceptional. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, LSE, I would um, hand over to you to talk us through the rest of the activities for the day and the week. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for, for that. Um, I'll, without saying much as well, I would like to thank all of our panelists for taking our time to, to deliver such an engaging, um, an engaging session. We have all indeed learned so much from this. There's been a lot of energy in, in the virtual space, I would say. Uh, so I would really like to thank us all for that. Uh, we have a whole a host of activities still lined up for the technology symposium and exhibition. We have an exhibition starting off at about 2 p.m., so in about an hour's time um, here um, on a platform that has the link that has also been shared with all the participants. So please make out time to join. Uh, on the slides showing as well, you would see some of the joining instructions for this exhibition section. We have about nine exhibitors ready to share some of their technologies, which they believe is geared towards reducing costs um, of producing a barrel of oil in the industry. Um, and next slide, you see the exhibition schedule. Please take note of it and um, dial in when you can uh, to be part of each of the various sections. Uh, a few companies were mentioned in during the panel session. Cypher Crescent with the WRFM solution will also be present at this e exhibition. Um, so make out time to join. Uh, we also have a host of short courses which are delivered free of charge to our participants. We have about 13 of them and we have um, different participants who have registered for this and have gotten the joining instructions. Please uh, do join in for your various section and um, make the rest of this uh, technology symposium be impactful for you. Um, for people that would like to uh, seek 
SP membership, we have some information for you. Uh, please look out for the emails that are displayed on the screen as well. So you could reach out to the various parties for uh, a sign up uh, of membership or for membership renewal. You could also visit um, our website, the SPU website on um, spu.org for you to see some of the benefits of being an SPU member, one of which is to gain access to very strong technical knowledge, which we have also gained during this panel session. Also, as part of our set of the technology symposium, we would like your feedback uh, to improve uh, for subsequent of um, subsequent symposium. As you know, this is the first that we've delivered virtually. And as you've heard previously, this was planned to be delivered as a face to face event. But due to the current realities of the COVID situation and the need to maintain social distancing, we've had to move this session online. So we appreciate that you give us your feedback so we could take that on into uh, subsequent sessions. At this point, I would like to say a big thank you and uh, hope to see you all at the uh, exhibition, which is in about 15 minutes. Please look out for the dial-in instructions and join us. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate it.